Okay, good evening, everyone. I would like to call tonight's regular council meeting of Monday, February the 10th to order. I do wish to acknowledge that we are meeting on the territory of the Souk Nation, and we do wish to express our gratitude. Before I get into tonight's meeting agenda, though, I do want to take a moment and just to recognize three very important people in our community. And that is Corey Mills, A.G. Jensen, A.J. Jensen, and Eric Blackmore. Um, over the past week, as you all know, our community was rocked with tragedy. And there are no words, really, at a time like this. However, I do want to express our deepest sorrow to the families, the friends, the teachers, acquaintances, everyone uh, that is grieving at this time. And I feel it's an event like this that, that we're all touched by in some way. I wish to express our gratitude to the JDF Search and Rescue, all the volunteers and everyone that just rallied in a way to help and to give. And as I think about this, you know, you can say things like, well, I'm a mother and blah, 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 or this and that. But when I think about these three men, I think interesting that just what an inspiration they are. They're three young men with their whole lives ahead of them. But in the short time that we have known them, they've brought out the very best in our community. The kindness of strangers, the giving, how everyone is just willing to drop what they're doing to go out and to help without any questions, without any judgment. How social media can be used in an effective way to communicate, to give updates, to share stories, to share kindness, good gestures. And, and just fond, precious memories. So truly, it's, um, we recognize how strong and solid our community is. And often, young people are tainted in an, you know, all those youth or this or that, but these young men brought out the best. And I find if, if any way that we can cherish and remember this and, and to find times of that young people in terms of how they inspire and how they motivate and how they can move a community. You know, if there is anything that we can remember, I think that's an important one. So I just wanted to take a moment again to express our sorrow, our gratitude, and, and just wanted to take a moment to do that before we begin. So recognizing, again, Corey Mills, A.J. Jensen and Eric Blackmore. You'll always be in our hearts and most certainly on our minds. Thank you. Okay, everyone, thank you for that, and thank you for listening. So, Council, I would like to draw your attention to tonight's agenda, and if you could please look, I'm looking for approval of the agenda with the addition of supplementary information. Item 4.1, bylaw number 748, zoning amendment bylaw 600-76-2020. And item 10.2, Committee of the Whole Recommendations. So those supplementary information. So move adoption with the amendment. Yeah, moved by Councillor Bateman, seconded by Councillor St. Pierre. Any questions on adoption? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed, that's carried unanimously. And that brings us right into our public hearing. So our first item tonight is 2096 Kennedy Street North. And Council, this I will draw your attention to the blue package, which is right here. And I'll turn it over to staff, firstly, for presentation, please. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Worship and Council. Uh, tonight we're here for third reading in the public hearing for 2096 Kennedy Street North. 2096 Kennedy Street North is within the community residential land use designation and the sewer specified area. Um, the subject property is within a neighborhood uh, adjacent to the sound, town center, and, which is shown in orange on the screen, and the CR designation is in pale yellow. The surrounding land uses are small lot residential R3, medium lot residential R2, and tent lot residential CD4. Within the immediate area, there are several large properties zoned medium density multifamily 2, RM2, which is the proposed zoning for the site. Two of the properties in the area are the BC Housing and CRD affordable housing sites on Drennan Street and Charters Road, respectively. The RM2 zone requires that 8% of the lot, which in this case is approximately 572 meters squared, be set aside as an amenity area for the residents to be used for social, aesthetic, recreational, or leisure purposes. So this can be a community garden, a gathering area, a tennis court, etc. Um, the parking requirement for multifamily development is 1.5 spaces per unit. The proposed development includes two per unit and some visitor parking, which is not a requirement in the zoning bylaw. If successful with the zoning amendment, the applicant will be required to upgrade Kennedy Street North to the modified urban local standards shown below and attached to your report. Uh, this upgrade has to occur prior to occupancy before the first occupancy certificate um, is issued for the site. In addition to this off-site upgrade, the applicant has also met the affordable housing requirements in the OCP by voluntarily contributing $70,700 to the Housing Reserve Fund as cash in lieu and by providing a needed housing typology per the Housing Needs Report. If successful with the rezoning, the next step for the application will be a development permit under DPA number three multifamily. At that time, a traffic impact assessment will be required to understand the impact on the transportation network and identify slash recommend timing and upgrades as necessary. No variances are anticipated with the development permit. Um, the applicant is providing more than the required amount of parking on the site, which is typically what we see with the accompanying DVP. Staff support this rezoning and the increase in density as the upgrade to Kennedy Street North will bring further pedestrian connectivity to an area that is lacking. The housing typology was identified as needed. The proposal aligns with Council's strategic priorities and the proposed development meets the policies and objectives in the OCP. Focusing low to medium density growth in the areas surrounding the town centre is important for sustainable land use and the development of infrastructure over time. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Sievers, for the presentation. I'll turn to Council for any questions or clarity comments that you may have before we turn to the public. Councillor Bateman? Yeah, so okay. through you to uh, Ms. Evertsi. Oh, <laughs> Did I get that right? Okay, um, I, I'm interested in the improvements to Kennedy Street North. Could you again? Tell me what that will that be a built out to secondary road standards and to your worship uh, it'll be built out to a modified urban local standard so the urban local standard typically has a sidewalk on each side in this case a sidewalk will be on one side um, with the parking on the other and it's that entire length of Kennedy Street North from Gollage up which is I think about 120 meters and what about Gollage itself? Will that be something that the district will need to look at? And yes, the district will need to look at um, Gollage itself. I did prepare for this question. Okay. Um, so as you can see, the district has a full right of way. It's, it's a hard, I guess, from a distance on Gollage. Um, with, with this proposed zoning amendment and given the other development pressures and ultimately that Charters is being looked at for a signal, um, Gollage and Charters itself are need to be part of the district's plan in the future. Okay. And we, we have no idea when that future might be. But you can tell me. <laughs> okay. And in terms of the, of the, I believe that the um, Aegis uh, builders would like to get this started this summer, if possible. Is that as you understand it? I don't know anything about a timeline, but um, typically uh, with a delegated DP, if this does make it through um, its rezoning, 
having summer for a building permit could be feasible mm -hmm. might be later fall mm -hmm. yeah. okay and a final comment would be okay the, the if this rezoning goes ahead they would be allowed as many as 35 townhomes they're opting for 27 um, do you, do you feel that it might be possible for them to have a smaller development? Three, so three worship less than 27? Yeah. Uh, often with developments like this, it's a balance in the performa. So looking at that cash and lieu contribution and, and doing a road upgrade, et cetera, um, you have to have a certain threshold of units right. to make it work. And yeah. I'm guessing that they landed at 27 likely for a reason. Right. Um, they are allowed higher than that yeah. in the zoning that they're asking for. Uh, but ultimately, that discretion is up is up to council. Mm -hmm. So RM2, um, from what you're saying, wouldn't be appropriate. Maybe it would be an RM1. OK, other questions or comments from members of council? No? OK. So I'll turn into the public hearing then. Now, before I do, there's just a statement I am to read. So this public hearing is being held pursuant to the Local Government Act. At this public hearing, any person who believes that their interest in property is affected by the proposed bylaw will be given a reasonable opportunity to be heard or to present written submissions respecting matters contained in the bylaw that are the subject of this hearing. Copies of written submissions received to date are available, and you'll find them in the yellow pages. It is important that all who speak at this hearing restrict their remarks to matters contained in the bylaw, and it is my responsibility as chair of this hearing to ensure that all remarks are so restricted. For those of you who wish to speak at the appropriate time, please commence your address to council by clearly stating your name and municipality of residence. Then you may give us the benefit of your views concerning the proposed bylaw. Submissions must be received before or during the public hearing in order to be considered by council. Members of council may, if they so wish, ask questions of you following your presentation or submission. However, the main function of council members this evening is to listen to the views of the public. It is not the function of council at this public hearing to debate the merits of the proposed bylaw with individual citizens. Everyone who deems his or her interest in property to be affected shall be given the opportunity to be heard at this hearing. No one will be or should feel discouraged or prevented from making his or her views known. Please note that this hearing forms part of tonight's regular meeting of council and as such is being video recorded. Videos and their contents, including any personal information disclosed during the hearing, will be posted and remains on the district website. So with that, I'd like to open this up to the public for any comments, and this is specifically for 2096 Kennedy Street North. <laughs> well, whichever you prefer, but you may, you may find it more comfortable to sit. And if you could please just turn on the microphone, it's just on the base there. Perfect, okay. thank you. Thank you, hello, my name is Kaija Griffiths. Um, this is my first time speaking at a council meeting, so let me know if I'm not doing it correctly. Um, I currently live on Dover Street, and I spoke with many of the other residents on Dover Street and on Solent. Um, Unfortunately, I was the only one who was able to attend this meeting tonight because most of us have young children. Um, so some of our concerns, we were concerned about parking, which you had already addressed. We were worried because our street already has a huge issue with parking because there are a lot of rentals. Um, so already we find on our street that there are three to four vehicles per home. So if that were the case here, there would already be a parking issue even with two parking spaces per unit. Um, one of our concerns was the access on Golage, which you had brought up. Um, it's such a thin road that right now it's pretty much a one lane only. So we have some concerns with the access on Golage. And then we were also concerned about the increased traffic on Dover. Since Charters currently is a one-way street, all of these residents will have to use Dover to come in and out. And right now, during peak hours, during school drop-off and pickup time, it's already over capacity and really challenging to come in and out on that road. Um, 
residents already can't turn left onto Highway 14, so this would increase that problem. I know that there was apparently talk about a light on charters, but this is the first I've heard of it. I don't know what you guys have in the works, if anything. Um, we're already having problems with people speeding on this residential road because of the increased traffic, so this would possibly increase those issues further. Um, uh, just sort of a, I don't know if this is included in the by, in the uh, bylaw, what, what I can talk about, but we're also concerned about the lack of infrastructure already in Souk. We already have a lack of childcare. We already have overcrowded schools. We already have thousands of people on wait lists for doctors. Um, and then lastly, one of our neighbors asked if I could bring her specific concerns. She is on in one of the properties that backs against this unit. She's in 2089. And she's concerned because right now there is a row of trees that gives privacy and also more appeal for her home. And she's worried if they remove these trees, then it will lower her property value, decrease the privacy. Um, and sort of decrease the souk nature feel because people don't move to souk for a city feel they move to souk because it's beautiful out here um i did not have everything in writing to submit to you but in case you guys are interested i did write it all down um some of our possible recommendations fewer units maybe 10 that would still fit within the character of the area uh keep the trees that separate the dover and kennedy properties minimum of two parking spaces per unit, which they already had addressed, address the concerns of increased traffic, look into a light at charters to encourage motorists to use charters over Dover Street. Um, and then I'm, I don't have any suggestions for Golage at this point. It just doesn't work well for increased traffic. Um, and then our last suggestion was add a small green space to the development or the develop, developer donate a portion of the profit to help with municipal parks, which they had already talked about. So that was, anyway. That was my, my list. <laughs> That's a great right. list. Thank Excellent. you very much. Thank you. I'll just, just a question from Councillor Bettles. Yeah, Go ahead. Well, thank you for, for uh, your brief there. And Thanks. I know you're a little bit nervous, but yes, you did it very, very well. Uh, very much appreciated to hear the comments from Dover. Um, Mike, uh, I just have a question on those units on Dover. Is yes. it one and a half parking spots per unit or did they go to two as well? Two. They went to two as they well, and you two. still have a lot of problems with cars. We have massive cars, eh? problems. We actually, at some point, are hoping to ask to have one side of the street be no parking, because at this point in time, we can't even get emergency vehicles up there half the time. Oh, we couldn't get a plow up there during the winters. Um, does Dover have a, a an overflow guest parking area? Okay, no. so this new one does, so I, I, I guess. So it might not be an issue. Well, there, but it might just, be, too. Might I, be, I'm yeah. very interested in what you have to say, because yeah. uh, when we were first elected last year, I went around to some of the streets and I was appalled at, at the amount of cars that are parked on the streets. Yeah. And I understand some of those things we, we can't do anything about now because they're years ago. Right. But I'm interested in your comments on Dover and that's very helpful to me, so I appreciate okay. that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Beddoes. And just for clarity on the light, um, because of the over on the far, well, our right you'll see the on off of drennan is the bc housing 170 right. units going in uh and then the other first 70 units so because of the added density in this area what's being worked on with our staff is um, upgrades and signalizing charters oh great so then because right now it is just a right in right, right out and so all of that is in the works with okay. um, the applicant in that case and the Ministry of Transportation because it's a provincial highway there. Okay, great, so, thank you. Good, thank you very Perfect. much. Okay, other speakers tonight? <laughs> Just look that way. Hi, uh, my name is Dean Haldane. I'm actually representing the Sioux Community Association on this matter. So, because we have the property bordering with this, with the Art Morris Park. And uh, I was kind of wondering, are they going to develop right up to the property line? That I don't know, and that's what I'm here to find out. W was that your only question, Mr. Haldane? Or is At that the moment, it? yes. Okay. But so at this point, it's a rezoning. So 
we're looking at the use and the density of the particular parcel. We don't have the exact lot layout just yet, um, but I'll turn to staff just to see what we may know. Uh, through your worship, yeah, I don't, planning doesn't de um, generally share site-specific plans for rezoning because it's easy to get married to something that might change very dramatically. But regardless, um, they would have to meet the rear lot setback. That uh, So the northern property line is actually the rear lot for this, which will have, a, um, I think it's at minimum three or four and a half meter setback. So nothing will be right up at the property line. Okay, now that's really all the question I had right now. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Haldane. Okay, other speakers this evening? Good evening, everybody. My name is Brenda Ryan, and I live at 2089 Charters Road. That's our family home. I did write a letter uh, that was submitted, so I hope everybody read it, and I sent some pictures. So we are here tonight because we have lived next to um, this townhouse development company that is proposing to do Meadowlands. So uh, we live right next door to Grasslands. and. I just don't understand what's happening to our neighborhood. We're just getting bombarded. Like we've been there 18 years and we've raised our kids. It's been awesome. And we understand development, like things change and our community is growing and it's, it's good. But our neighborhood, like holy man, we're getting like two BC housing projects that have gone through. We've got uh, a 22 unit a townhouse complex next to us, now a block over to a proposed 27 unit complex is going to go through. Like, I just, we don't understand. Like, we just feel like, I don't know, the bomb has dropped on us. Like, there's not even any sidewalks. Have you guys walked down Kennedy Road for crying out loud? Like, I don't, we just, it doesn't make sense to us at all. I, I just feel like, you guys need to go walk around the neighborhood and and just check this out like there's souk elementary you've got all the schools are within walking distance there there's no sidewalks there's hardly any street lights like charters road it couldn't be any blacker at night like i it's, we're just really concerned and we all have choices you know like we're it's just really sad how how our neighborhood has changed Thanks for listening. Thank you, Ms. Ryan. Other comments or questions from members of the public tonight? Call for a second time for any comments or questions. This is the only opportunity to speak on the rezoning, so it would have to be tonight. Third and final time for any from members of the public okay so I'm not seeing anything so for that I will now call the public hearing is closed and we'll revert the matter back to members of council are there follow-up items for staff so we do know that there's road improvements that are needed in this particular area Charters Road in particular has been discussed for a number of years and so I think um, with the schools, it's becoming, it, it's not just a residential road, it's, it's, a, it's a road to, can, to get people through the schools, which is why it's so busy there in the morning. And so that is sort of a priority, which is why you can see that um, this is in the works for that to be upgraded. In terms of Kennedy, the project would have a sidewalk installed on the one side of the road, as we heard in the presentation. Was there discussion about, um, I saw in here about another east-west connection. Where, where is that? I'm just trying to ask for clarity now where that would be. To your worship, uh, in the original 2009 TMP, there is a Grant Road east connection, so just north of the property for that to extend to charters. 
Uh, and then the other east-west connection is the Throop connector. So Throop going all the way through um, to meet to Phillips Road, which is not on the map. Oh, I see. So either, so where the cul-de-sac is sort of on the top left part, just north of the rectangle? Correct. That's Grant Road East. That's um, Grant Road. Yeah. So then that would connect through to Charters. And we have that right away already? We do not. Okay. Um, so the property in between um, at time of development, that east-west connector, I believe, is a lower priority than the Throop connector because of the Throop connector connects more um, north-south roads than the Grant Road East and has a little less connectivity issues as you move west. Grant Road ends up becoming a little segmented. I see. Okay. So in terms of some of the trees that are currently on the property that provide some privacy and shade and the like for existing residents, is there some way that our staff can work with the development company to see what can be retained there? Uh, yes, that's part of a development permit application is to see what tree stands can remain. Um, there's the amenity area that is required and then it would be down to the landscaping and what they decide to do. Okay, and then the amenity area, is that where the developer would look to see what would be a good fit for the project and would sort of make that determination in advance of the project usually? It depends it, okay. who you're going to be marketing the project to. Um, in this case, I did have a conversation about community gardens, and for this particular development, they'd rather offer that to the folks buying in as part of their backyard patio um, raised beds um, for private use, or they'll have a gathering area with a maybe community garden. It's tough to um, have a strata with that amenity area with a community garden. It's sometimes the running of it becomes mm -hmm. a bit of an issue. So uh, we can't dictate how the amenity space will be, just that it is required to be there. Okay. Okay. Other questions or comments from councillors? Yeah. Councillor Lajeunesse, then St. Pierre. So uh, last week I spoke with the property owner of 2104 and I told him that this property was up for a rezone. And I asked him if he would be interested in dedicating some road right away through his property from charters across to that development. And he said that he would definitely be willing to entertain that idea. 2104 would so be... Oh, so like, okay, so to halfway up on the right-hand side. So in that case, um, in terms of staff following up, I'm just looking procedurally, uh, I, I, Councillor Lajeunesse, if you could provide contact information to our planning staff accordingly as soon as you can. They can then follow up just to see what may or may, may be possible and whether or not that works. Okay, Councillor St. Pierre. I'd like to thank the uh, people that spoke because one thing that became very clear was uh, with the schools and the increase in the population, this might be one of the next areas we want to consider for sidewalks. Uh, I know that we don't have a lot of money in our sidewalks fund, but it keeps trickling in. But if we're looking at lights at charters, we're looking at the schools, we're looking at a massive increased number of people, uh, especially you know young people traveling to school, this might actually be a place that we might want to prioritize for sidewalks. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if our transportation master plan is going to address that specifically, but hopefully maybe. Uh, and of course, if we're doing that, we should also have some lights, if it's possible, again. Uh, so I think that those things need to be uh, addressed in an area that's actually going to have that many people in it. Other comments? Or Councillor Beddoes? Yeah, just uh, I have walked the area. I have walked down Kennedy Street, and uh, I'm very, very uh, familiar with charters, and uh, I share some of the concerns. I mean... Uh, we're, we're desperately needing sidewalks. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't have tons of money, but I have to agree with Councillor St. Pierre. If we could certainly look at this area for sidewalks because of the location of the school. I was uh, uh, looking over this uh, development <clears throat> and the comments from Dover. <clears throat> I am pleased that they are going to have visitors parking mm -hmm. because the two parking stalls isn't going to be enough, so I'm glad that's looked after. 
we're at a great disadvantage once again because we do not have the transportation master plan and uh, I really hate making these sort of decisions without first having a rigorous review of that transportation master plan. Uh, you know, when it comes to a light on uh, Highway 14 at Charters, I'm, I'm not exactly ecstatic about that light on a hill. Uh, the Throop Road uh, extension, I'd, I'd be delighted if that went through, uh, but I understand there's some hurdles there. Um, it's, a, it's a tough one. Um, I certainly hear what the residents say, and I guess over the next few years, it's our job to try and make that neighborhood a bit better. Uh, but as for the this development, uh, Kennedy Street, uh, I don't want to insult anybody, but it's a bit of a mess going up that street, and uh, a sidewalk on one side and widening it is going to make a, a great improvement to that street. Uh, it's too bad it didn't continue on down to college, but uh, that might be a lot to ask for a developer. So all in all, I am pleased with some things and I'm frustrated with others, but uh, uh, I do appreciate the people speaking here tonight because it uh, gives us something to think about. So thank you. Um, Ms. Everts, his response? Uh, to respond, I, the TMP is not finalized. However, in the draft TMP, uh, Charters is identified as a complete street, so meaning sidewalks on either side, bike lanes, and the travel lanes. And Gollage is identified as being widened and having the sidewalks. Um, it's a matter, I think, of figuring out a priority for those projects and given the development pressure for council to make a decision about how they want that to be prioritized in upcoming capital plans and um, through finalizing the TMP. Does that help follow up? Yeah, I just, um, that's wonderful. I think that's probably uh, some things that our residents want to hear too, that it's, it's not, we're not just blindly thundering our head. The, these things are, are thought about and that there is a plan coming. Uh, eventually I will see it, but uh, it's nice that uh, those things are taken care of. Thank you very much. Councillor Bateman. Okay. Um, I, I feel Councillor Lajeunesse's uh, Point is a bit of a game changer with that access to charters. Um, potential. 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 We don't. No, exactly. So, yeah. so I'm back to the pause that refreshes my campaign slogan. I think we need to ask this developer to be patient, come back to us next year when we have a few more uh, details worked out here. We've, we'll then have digested the transportation master plan, we'll have had OCP process. Uh, this is the first of undoubtedly other rezoning applications in the same area. And the density, as one of our uh, speakers said just now, is, is just mushrooming. That's the east end of the town center. Um, I'm, you know, I was, yeah, I'm not even sure it's part of the, t the town center itself. It might be a little outside the fringe of the town center. Anyway, I feel that there's an awful lot of questions here. Um, improving Kennedy. Street would be great. Uh, Gollage currently has the bollards on it. Uh, at some point in the future, we will uh, extend, um, widen that, as, as our planner tells us. And um, so, yeah, I, my feeling is, can you please be patient? And this could go out to a lot of developers. We also have a sewer treatment plant to expand. We'll be discussing that later tonight. Uh, we're, we're nearing. Um, we're at 70 plus percent capacity on it. Um, so yeah, that, that, those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bateman. Councillor Logans, then Logans, pardon me, then Councillor St. Pierre. No, it's Logans, but I accept Logans equally. <laughs> Either one is totally fine with me. Um, uh, yes, I just wanted to say that I do support this development, having heard the concerns of the neighborhood. I think that uh, this development in the area that it is right now will actually help council prioritize that area as a region for those changes that need to happen. And if we do halt that development and make it wait while allowing the other developments to happen around it, um, it, will, it will just push uh, any sidewalk improvements and road improvements further down the line. Uh, putting this here, it's a bit of a conflict in the sense of you're going to have construction, you're going to have, you know, the time that it takes to upgrade the roads and, and et cetera in the area, but that will put us in the position where it pressures us to make this a priority. So I think it's important um, 
not only to have the variety of, of housing that we'll have in this area, but also to put a bit of more pressure on us to fix this area. And no, I haven't walked Charter Street because I'm not crazy and I feel sorry for everyone who has to because it's horrendous. So doing this will really kind of push things in the right direction, I think. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor St. Pierre. I fully support uh, Councillor Logan's position on this. Uh, I would also point out that our housing needs assessment really says that these are units that we desperately, desperately need. And we have a developer here that's stepping forward and actually providing another alternative to you know $600,000 single family detached. And that's something we desperately need. We need homes at a different price point uh, so that you know young families can actually enter the housing market as well so that different people in suit can actually have housing. Uh, change is hard and uh, I guess it's our job to try and make it as wonderful as possible and we'll be trying. Reply, Councillor Bateman? Not necessarily a reply. Okay. Uh, I, I was, I toured Grasslands yesterday, the, the other development, the first of the developments by Aegis Builders and it's, it's nicely designed. The homes are coming in at 499,000 for a 1,300 square foot, I believe, approximately townhouse. Um, yeah, that's it. I think the draw for this area is that you could, I, I hear the need for sidewalks in the area, but it's the proximity to the core. It's close to transit on Highway 14, uh, the schools, um, you can easily go up to the, the ball field and then take the trail over to Sea Park and play around a golf on the way. Like with all the activity that's in the back area of this property, and it's timely. Uh, once the tr like the trans when we hear TMP for the benefit of the public, that's transportation master plan. Our last plan was adopted in 2009. We have another one that's in a draft form, so that's what our staff is referencing. So they are looking at the existing plan because that's the one that's adopted by council. But because the consultation for an updated one is in the works. They're also looking into what that those findings are. The findings that we're seeing is that we need more sidewalks and we need to make them a priority. And so with some of these other developments, so with the BC housing projects, that's through the CRD housing initiative, they haven't come from development permit yet. They're all going through a referral process. So we know that the property has been acquired. Uh, we know that this is roughly the density that fits. It might give or take. We know that they're looking for market, below market, um, attainable and different rate classes and they're just finalizing those details. Would those come to, to would they qualify for delegated authority by staff or would those actually come before council? Your Worship, they will come before council because each includes a parking variance. Uh, so we'll bring the entirety of the development permit to council for approval. Do you have a sense of when the timing on that is? It depends on a couple things for each project. So Drennan, there's um, some covenant work that okay. staff is doing that will come first. And with charters, it's the, the signalization work and then determining the priority for essentially the District of Souk's role in the rest of the, the network. Okay, so, okay, um, so. We're having early conversations, but also determining what's best for phasing out and, and figuring out the priority of college and charters and what needs to happen. Okay, thank you. So just back to one of our first speakers tonight, just in terms of asking that's because it hasn't fully come to us yet. It's in a draft form we haven't had. It'll still come, it, as you hear, it's coming for public input and feedback and for council to give approval to. It's just... They've done this, but it's all still in the draft planning form, which is why you know I appreciate when you said you've not heard of that yet. We just know that they've been acquired and the rest of it will still come. So then it ties in nicely with the rest of the planning work. And I think as this happens, as Councillor Logan says, it's essential that we really start green lighting and prioritizing some of these projects. Charters, as I mentioned earlier, has been on the books now uh for a full upgrade it desperately needs it it's crumbling into a ravine there and it's not safe to walk on at all so i i don't walk it either although i drive it because it's it's not a walkable although i see people walking it uh, okay so any other clarity or comments from staff needed at this point we've uh, received the report you've had your questions answered i do support the development as well 
Uh, I think it's um, a necessary product. I hear a lot of discussion about the price points, um, but it's just having units that, that people can choose to be in without being in, uh, still have the ability to buy that isn't a condo. And the amenity area, I think, is very important for those residents. Um, people want a place where they can take their dog out in the middle of the night, and then they don't have to walk on an area that there's no sidewalks on to find green space. Like, these are some important pieces, gathering spaces uh, for the community as well. Anything further? So at this point, I'll go like to council. Sorry, Councillor yeah, Bateman, you had hand Get a clarification. The, these units at Grasslands are actually 439. Um, we were checking out Aaronwood as well at the recommendation of one of the writers, and they're up at 499. So 439. Okay. Thank you. But from a year from now, that could change this. Good. Good. Three months can now it could change because we're not in the we'll see okay so we'll turn this over to council we do have um, okay we're looking to rescind motions can I just um, oh that's the yellow pages can I get clarity council on this uh, yes we're looking to rescind the first and second reading to change to this um, in order to Which was first and second? Oh, those two motions from the 13th um, and, and replace them with these two. Um, so that's why it says rescind and then it has a replacement um, on the upcoming slides. I see. Okay. So there's a recommendation here and the first, did, and these all have to be read separately? Um, Your Worship, um, no, it doesn't. Uh, you can do uh, that, the, the rescinding part and the, that prior to adoption piece together. Okay. And then just give third reading on its own. I see. Okay. So the first part of this is that Council rescind motions 2020-8 and 2020-9 that prior to issuance of the first building permit for the site, the applicant enter into a works and services agreement and install all off-site works prior to issuance of the first occupancy certificate for the upgrade of Kennedy Street North between Gollage Avenue and 2096 Kennedy Street North to the modified urban local standard as attached, 2020-09, that prior to issuance of the first building permit for the site, the applicant pays $70,700 to bylaw number 259 Housing Reserve Fund Establishment Bylaw 2006, and that prior to adoption of bylaw number 748 Zoning Amendment Bylaw 600 76 2020, a Section 219 covenant be registered on title for a works and services agreement and for a contribution payment to the Housing Reserve Fund in the amount of 70700 I have a mover by Councillor St. Pierre and seconded by Councillor Logans. Any questions or comments on what we are doing here at this moment? Councillor Logans. So just to clarify, the, the, we rescinded that motion to, because it's now part of the cover, covenant. Is that what's happening? I'm not quite, yeah. Through your worship, that's correct. So um, we're putting it into the covenant so it's not on just title. living in the resolution. Perfect, thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Any questions? So I'll call the question, all those in favor? Opposed? Councillor Bateman is opposed. The next part is that Council give third reading to bylaw number 748, Zoning Amendment Bylaw 600 76 2020. It's moved by Councillor St. Pierre and seconded by Councillor Logans. So, just a couple of things I'd ask for staff then is that um, to work with the developer about retention of the trees and then also in regards to the property owner, the community association up north, just um, as information on the site layout progresses, if there can be communication over so that they are aware of what is being planned as it impacts their property. Okay, that request there. Questions, comments, anything else on third? Moved and seconded, all those in favor? Opposed? And that too is carried, that's carried unanimously. Okay, thank you. I think that concludes that matter. Thank you very much everyone for attending and for your comments. So moving into the agenda, our next item on business here, item five, is minutes for adoption. Um, so I have meeting that the minutes of the January 13, 2020 regular council meeting be adopted as amended. I have a mover. 
Moved by Councillor Beddoes, seconded by Councillor St. Pierre. Questions? Seeing none, all those in feet. Uh, I'm on the 13th. For mm -hmm. the 13th? I'm on the 13th. Okay. This is page uh, 3 of 11. Or okay. Page 33 in the agenda package. It's Eric Boucher, not Bouche. Eric Boucher. Okay, so we need an R for yeah. Mr. Boucher. Okay. And let's see. We're still uh, on the 13th. February 3rd. Okay. Yep. That's why I'm doing this. Are we doing this, this as consent? So I do I, February 3rd now? Well, there, I, I'm doing it uh, one at a time because okay. I just moved and seconded that one. So all those in favor? Opposed? It's carried unanimously. January 27th. Uh, move adoption by Councillor St. Pierre, seconded by Councillor Be Beddoes. Questions or corrections on the 27th? I would like to thank Councillor Bateman for chairing that meeting in my absence and for handling matters over the last while. Thank you. Any amendments, though? Not that okay, one. Okay, not on that one. All those in favor? <laughs> Opposed? It's carried unanimously. And February 3rd, motion to adopt by Councillor St. Pierre and seconded by Councillor Lajeunesse and Councillor Bateman. We have an amendment. Well, yeah, on Thanks. page 3 of 8, which is page 55 of the agenda package under EMCS, uh, the minutes state that uh, Council desired a further discussion on this topic prior to third reading of the bylaw. What I'd like reflected in the minutes was the fact that I had to recuse myself at that moment because I'm the EMCS Society's past president and we would have lost quorum at that point. So that was the reason we did not discuss the, uh, that item last Monday. Okay, that's important to note. So yeah. if that can be added yeah. as to when Councillor Bateman departed and a Well, note. I didn't depart because well, I couldn't depart. You couldn't Otherwise, depart, we right. lost quorum. Okay, so I think there needs to be a notation as to okay. that. Okay, good point. Other, any other items? Um. No, that's fine. Yeah. yeah, I see that you have something um, a little bit later on page five where you did need to make a few. Yeah, you yeah I've sent in some that. notes to staff. Well, here's where you did need to do the point of yeah. orders because of the, yeah. because of that. Okay, so thank you for catching okay. that. Okay, very good. Um, so that's been moved and seconded. So all those in favor of adoption, opposed, that's carried unanimously. Okay, item five, item six. We have a delegation this evening under 6.1, centric cycle. Lighting the footprint forward. And Mr. <coughs> Oliver Hockenall, is that correct? Okay, will be addressing us tonight. And sir, you have five minutes tonight for your presentation. Please turn on the microphone. And Ms. Rear will be setting the timer. Okay. Let me get a little bit prepared here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to uh, present to you. Uh, I know that you guys are tremendously busy so as we, as we've got going with the, the the clock is ticking um, I just wanted to uh, respond actually immediately to some of the comments that were made about the development that was happening and uh, if you notice how much how much of the issues revolved around ca our car centric culture and I think that that this is something that I want to address with you that if you devise your transportation plan around cycling in a Dutch manner, you will solve many problems, including overweight, including the fact of children having the opportunity to be independent, etc. So uh, I'll just go through these uh, slides here. Okay. Let's see now. Um, so my name is Oliver Hockenhall. I love Souk. Very happy to be here. Um, I've biked all my life. I don't own a car. Transition Souk is aware and supportive of the general idea of this proposal. I've received a very positive response to the premise from the Tourism Vancouver Island organization and will be seeking letters of support from numerous other tourism, cultural, indigenous, artistic groups as well as cycling coalitions. 
I am hoping ultimately that the Sioux District would be willing to use its own resources to lobby for this, to take it on as I work full time. I would be happy to consult, however, if you would be interested. I've done a lot of research on this issue. Um, let's see now if these things move here. Okay. Okay, so this is a draft proposal for a cycling and e-cycling cultural and tourism corridor from Souk to Port Renfrew. And I've also included a review uh, and scaled possibilities for increasing cycling in the Souk region itself. So um, I have a number of asks for this presentation from you. Uh, one of them is a letter uh, and uh, the district should take advantage of the upcoming developments by calling upon the provincial government to impress upon BC MOTI, which is the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure, to make improvements along Highway 14 and Otter Point Road safe and inviting for cycling and e-cycling, and to encourage tourism and cultural, environmental, and First Nations awareness. To encourage cycling, what is needed is safe corridors. This is how it's done. A 1950s style road shoulder is, as now proposed by Moti, only conforms to the centrality of the automobile. The best and safest case scenario are grade separated bike lanes as designated in the BC government's own Clean BC initiative, an initiative that appears to be of little concern of Moti for this $85 million project. As Moti seems unwilling to consider best cycling route protocols, they should at the very least make sure that the shoulder is clearly marked as an active transportation route, utilizing crucial junctures and, turns, and, and at turns using bollards and rumble strips. Painting the active transportation road shoulder a bright green or a f for bureaucratic reasons that is not possible, a different culture, a different color simply makes sense and is relatively inexpensive. So my proposal to you is, is in, incremental. It's not the best process. It's not the best uh, system that it is available that you would see in places in Europe and in cultures or in societies that uh, recognize the importance of cycling. But these incremental uh, possibilities should be evoked in this situation. It is of extreme importance to be proactive in designing and implementing transportation strategies to encourage and support cycling. It is insufficient, dangerous, and counterproductive to use methodologies of transportation design that come from the past decades that were and are solely or majorly related to automobile transport. It is crucial to redesign the shoulders so that automobile drivers learn to register automatically that the shoulder is not simply an extension of their lane primarily for the purpose of emergency stopping, but that is in itself a transportation, but that it, it, it in itself is a transportation lane for preferred transportation platforms. So I have a number of uh, proposals for you that, that should be uh, put forward. Uh, oh my God, I'm almost out of time. So I'm just gonna actually just go through this through the pictures here. You see that these are nice bollards here. These are fin bollards, something like that could be used. You could imagine it. Culturally, this place is, is, is uh, full of possibilities and we should uh, use the possibilities that are available to us. This thing is not clicking forward again. There we go. Tourism potential is great. Um, if you could just pause for a moment, Mr. Hockenall. Sure. Councilor Can I move Bateman? another three minutes for? Okay, move okay. another three minutes by Councillor Bateman and seconded by Councillor St. Pierre. All those in favor, opposed, that's carried unanimously and we'll just have another three minutes on the timer Okay, I'm you. very sorry for uh, this. Uh, it's not, I think it's not really clicking forward. Oh, good. So um, the tourism, tourism is, uh, the tourism potential is extremely great here. Uh, I ask you to review these things because I'm just gonna go through this rather quickly. Uh, infrastructure is always a sane investment. Uh, we need to, should I point it towards this thing or where should I point it to? So in the Netherlands, as you see, and they, what they're doing right now, let's say an example, there's a city in uh, Scotland that has f uh, 14, uh, thousand people about the same population of Souk and they've uh, hired consultants from Netherlands to go over their plan to devise it in terms of in terms of cycling 
So, and if there is a future, it is Dutch. So I really um, ask that you, and this is an example of right out here. So you do have a couple of, 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 uh, of uh, uh, shoulders that are also marked for bicycles, but it's used for parking. So the only way to prevent that would be to, to have actually painted that road, to put some bollards, and to put up some signs. It's, and these things are not that expensive. So, you know, to make people more aware of the potentials of this, that's all I ask that you do. Uh, I'm also, there's also uh, uh, this area here that uh, should be uh, a bike trail from West Coast Road up to Kemp Lake. That's a private road available right now that could be an excellent bike route. And then there's a couple of design issues that uh, should be, uh, people should be aware of, particularly in terms of uh, bike parking. Uh, uh, interestingly enough, statistics show that uh, bike parking is very important for increasing cycling. So if you don't have a place to, bike, to park your bike, you know, it's problematic. Um, and, and the other thing that I wanted to mention is that e-bikes are becoming very, very important. It's the, it's the most increased sales for bikes, and they require a different kind of parking. So that's something to consider when you move forward that, with that. Okay, so. So, and those are examples of really good um, uh, bike corrals. Ideally, and here's an example from uh, Holland again, where there's the uh, corral, the bike corral ha has a solar roof that could be used to energize your bike. Okay. So that's basically, and they, these, again, these are bollards as, as well. And if you have bollards, people feel a lot safer. And again, these things are inexpensive and should be done. Moti is, is in my opinion, uh, very 1950s and is not looking forward to what could be done and uh, uh, inexpensive methods for increasing cycling and increasing cycling culture. So, as an example, you have a solar bike lane in the Netherlands and a, a pilot project testing bike path. So, you know, you guys should be pushing uh, the Ministry of Transportation to be innovative and not to just follow the rules, to say, hey, things have to change and they have to change now. Here's an example of lights. So that's, uh, and you will have the ass in there and that's uh, two seconds and uh, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you very much for the presentation. If you are able to share it, um, allow our staff to share it with us, that would be great sure, because it, then at least it's nice to have that to, to spend a, met, a bit more time on. I'm happy to. Councillor Beddoes? Yeah, there's a very interesting, uh, just a couple little comments. Uh, we're not flat like Holland, but it's oh, okay. Oh, 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 <laughs> oh no, no, I will respond just to that right it, away. I will respond uh, to that right away, my friend. Is, uh, that <laughs> Uh, on your comment about having a place to pipe, uh, park bikes, if you go down to Sea Park, uh, yes. we just put a, a very large addition, a gymnasium there, right. a, as well as uh, covered bike parking uh, to allow people from the community to bike down to our Sea Park. Our parks and trails has made leaps and bounds over the last few years. So locally, we are working uh, very much in the idea of what you're presenting. I do have a little bit of trouble with your corridor between here and Port Renfrew. Having traveled that route mm -hmm. many times, because mm -hmm. I do the food bank run out there, mm -hmm. uh, in order to uh, make that road even travelable by, <laughs> by cars, never mind bikes, you're looking at millions of dollars, and I would say hundreds of millions of dollars. There's no shoulders, there's single lane bridges, which are Bailey bridges. It's just absolutely atrocious out there. And what worries me is, I don't mind what you say well, locally. What we can do locally, we have power on. Highway 14 out to Renfrew, I have a lot of concerns with. Is that if we start lobbying for them to spend hundreds of millions of dollars. It's not hundreds of millions well, of dollars. Well, I, 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 I will, I will, will take issue with that, that, but that's okay. We, right. can, we can disagree. Sure. I know what's going on on this side of town mm -hmm. for a, a four-laning, two-kilometer section is right. $65 million. Mm -hmm. 
I know what the road's like out mm-hmm. there. There is no curves. Well, as, at all, at okay, all. Do you want a response for that? Okay. Well, just, that, what, no, just, let, just let me finish okay, first, sure. because I, I do have some experience out there. Sure. So I guess my I concern too. is I, I understand what you, you want to accomplish, and I don't have mm-hmm. any problems with what you accomplish. Mm-hmm. But for me, it's, it's a matter of priorities. If mm-hmm. I was going to uh, go to the Ministry of Transportation, I would, I'd be more willing to champion a cause for the other way because 70% of our people that live in Souk work in Greater Victoria, and I would rather put that money in that end of town rather than out to Renfrew. That's right. all I'm saying. Right. Uh, if, you, if you take a look at the uh, Highway 14 Otter Point Road uh, development that they're talking about, right, that, that's my main concern. This is the main focus. And if you, if they're talking about extending the shoulder on Otter Point Road, and there's also a, a possibility of doing that from uh, the connection to Otter Point Road to Brown French Beach. Okay, that could be a good start. That could be a really good start because that, that they're already doing that with the shoulder. They're, doing, they're going to go ahead with that. So if that was actually with bollards and paint and with signs, then you're not talking about huge expense. So much money is being spent on car-centric culture. And yet so, Mr. Nothing- Hockenall, like we do need to get on okay, with our sure, agenda, sure, so we certainly sure. appreciate your comments. Okay. I will just share, though, that that particular area falls outside our jurisdiction, so we can certainly put that forward to the province and to our Juan de Fuca director, Mike Hicks, um, and it's not in our municipal boundary. So much like I don't want, or well, we appreciate opinions from other local government weighing into our community, um, it's also like we do need to stay within our own jurisdiction. But, but this has to do with tourism as well. We appreciate you're, you're that. Pushing so that we idea. will work with, I have the microphone now, so we really appreciate your feedback um, and we'll take that into consideration as we go forward. And if you could certainly share your PowerPoint, we would appreciate that. Councillor St. Pierre? <clears throat> More of a comment than a question, but I'm taking away from your presentation that having sufficient parking would make a huge difference in terms of adoption of e-bikes and cycling uh, anywhere, really. Yes. But having safe and sufficient parking, would you yes. consider that the priority? And that's quick. Would that be the priority in terms of infrastructure to actually encourage cycling? I think if it was designed properly, yes. Okay. Uh, I would also point out that I've had dreams of taking $85 million and spending $20 million of it to buy one e-bike for every citizen in Souk, and then a small portion of the rest to improve our trails. But let's... That's not an option right at this very moment, and I'm very pleased that the Ministry of Transportation is trying to make our highways safer so that fewer people will die on them. So that's kind of nice, too. Well, we know what, we're gonna, what you're going to be doing when you win the Super Lotto. That's right. uh, I, I just wanted to mention yes, again that, that that presentation also includes a number of points about Souk itself. So yes, it, okay. and we are Thank going you. to be kicking off like our work on our Parks and Trails Master Plan is happening as well. There's been improvements by the Juan de Fuca Trail Society to make our in-town connections a lot safer. We're working on progressing a connection between Sun River and the balance of Souk, which is also vital, which gets people off of the main roads because the trail system is where the bird, the crow flies. It's faster. It's more direct system than going on the rails. Councillor Bateman. Yeah, thank you for your presentation, and thank you for your earlier correspondence with Council, where we... we gave you some feedback. Yes, initially. thank you very much. And one of the key points, I believe, was the transportation master plan is incoming. And this, unlike some transportation plans, this is an active transportation plan. Cycling's being given uh, all due consideration in the plan. Um, through you to staff, can anyone give us some input? No, I don't see anyone here who might be able to do that. Give us input on. Well, I know direct that, your comments to me and your question. You yes. had a question for okay. staff, and when I'm was that? I'm curious about you cut the off? cycling content of the transportation master plan, whether okay. we've had any early intimations. So now I will field that over to our acting CAO. So you're asking about cycling with the transportation master plan, and do you have any feedback you can give us at this time? Will some of that weave into the parks and trails master plan? Um, Through your worship, I'm not 100% sure, but I believe definitely cycling is being considered in the Parks and Trails Master Plan. I'm not 100% sure. I don't want to speak to the roads and and misspeak, but I think um, as uh, the 
Tanisha, who was here earlier, was talking about the uh, roads. Um, they were talking about bike lanes, so I would imagine that that has been considered in other roads and recommendations going to be coming forward in the transportation master plan. So both okay. of those are nearing finalization, so they should be coming to council in the next uh, month, hopefully. And what we'll be looking for is when we see the road descriptions, that's where it shows what sort of the cross section would look like. Uh, will it have sidewalks and, and on one side, both side, and then the width and what the designated bike lanes. So Wadham's Way would be an example of multi-purpose. Eventually should be on both sides of the road. Okay, does that help? Okay, perfect. Okay, thank um, you. We need to move on. So thank you very much for your presentation tonight, sir. Okay. Councillor St. Pierre, like we're moving on, is is a question for the speaker or? Okay, I don't want to get into debating something that isn't on the agenda. So, okay. I would just point so, out that uh, e-bikes are actually being recognized all over as a good way to actually move people away from cars, and that they actually overcome the large distances and the hills that we have to deal with in Canada all over the damn place. Okay, thank you for that, and. Okay, we'll save this and move on. Okay, so item seven is report of the chief administrative officer. So our Mr. McKinnis is on vacation right now. So we have our director of finance, um, Rachel Gray, is standing in as our acting CAO. So thank you. Any comments tonight? Um, just a short one, quick one. Um, quick um, staffing update is we have filled um, the director of planning position. So it's someone's anticipated to be starting at the end of March, which will fill a much needed vacancy for us. Um, as you mentioned, the director of finance position has been filled. Um, I hear she's awesome. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, and we are just in the process of finalizing the interviews for the director of operations position. So um, those are gonna fill some much needed vacancies for staff in order to get us to um, do some proper planning for 2020 going forward to um, uh, provide some recommendations to council on all of the transportation master plan, parks and trails master plan, uh, child care needs assessments, all of these reports that we've gotten um, and are will be getting in 2020. So getting those key staff positions filled will help us go a long way to provide some sound recommendations to council that ensure that all departments have had input in. Um, so that's about it. Excellent. Thank you very much and congratulations. We're delighted. Okay, so that brings us to item eight, which is our public question and comment period. So this is for all items on tonight's agenda, except for the public hearing, because the public hearing is closed. So any other items, we'd like to welcome any member of the public forward. If you could please provide us with your full name and which agenda item you're speaking to, so then we can reference it properly in our documents. And you'll have up to two minutes, and our deputy corporate officer will be working the timer. Hi, my name is Britt Santowski, and I live in Souk. Okay, um, and I am here to talk to item number 10.1 uh, regarding the funding for South Island Prosperity Project and Souk Region Chamber of Commerce. And I'd like to thank Council for the time that you've given to listen to my presentations last year. And Karen, I understand, came and spoke at the COW Committee the whole meeting. Um, I just want to emphasize that I believe that it is important that we nurture a made in Souk solution. Um, I, the South Island Prosperity Group does really good work. Uh, and they look at things from a multi-municipality perspective. And as we know with issues dealing with the CRD, like BC Transit, often work is done up until the West Shore Line and then it stops before it gets to Souk. Souk is a unique community, it is geographically separate, and it has its own distinct needs. And to lump Souk in with a multi-municipal region, I think that comes at a loss to Souk. Uh, and Souk is also notorious for building many empires. Uh, we have, uh, when it comes to business development, uh, we have the EDG, we have CERTA, and we have the chamber in Souk. 
and then throwing in another entity to that uh, just broadens the base. And uh, just like to remind you that the chamber is an entity in its own right that is known Canada wide. And just last week, I received a call from a writer in Seattle who was looking for information on the, the coastline of Souk. And these are the kinds of services that we provide. Thank you for listening. Bye. Thank you, Ms. Santowski. Other speakers this evening? Just before you begin, um, just over to staff, if you could just reset the timer, please. It's flashing away. Okay, okay go ahead, this please. This is not my thing that I normally do. Um, my name is Amanda Dowie. Uh, we are Souk residents in the Cicinos area. This actually isn't in regards to an agenda item tonight, but something that happened at the January 27th meeting that didn't have a lot of public notice so that I was at another meeting and couldn't speak to it. Um, Councillor St. Pierre brought forward a motion regarding the thresholds for farm level income, or farm tax income, sorry. I don't like this talk. <laughs> um, I'm slightly disappointed in the way that this was brought forward. Uh, you did mention Bill C-52, or Bill 52 and C-15, and the backlash that they have received. Those two bills were both introduced in very much the same way. Um, it was proposed that farm income thresholds be raised to $7,000 across the board. Members of council had some really great questions that evening um, that were not able to be answered by the proposer or by staff because they didn't have that information ahead of time. Um, I can take a minute and let you know some of those answers right now. Current levels are $10,000 on parcels under two acres, $2,500 on parcels of two to 10 acres, and on parcels above 10 acres, are $2,500 plus 5% of the actual value of any land in excess of 10, 10 acres. Yeah. Um, firstly, I'd like to note that those parcel sizes are in regards to land under production for farming. So it's not really possible anymore to have farm status on a handful of chickens that you sell for eggs and meat. Um, one of the reasons that the higher level for small parcels was put into place was in Oak Bay there were a number of properties that were very high value properties that were obtaining farm status by having small um, flower stands and selling flowers to their neighbors and greatly reducing their property tax values. One of the examples given was farmers with hay fields and really you need a lot of property to make $10,000 off of hay $2,500 off of hay. Um, and if your entire farm income comes off of hay, hay sales, then one bad weather year can wipe out your entire farm income. Okay, I need you to wrap up, Ms. Dowie. Absolutely. Um, my family is one of the ones that was directly impacted by this proposed um, motion. Uh, we have four acres in total, and we struggle to keep two acres under production. Our farming time, on top of our full-time jobs, I put in about 20 to 40 hours of farm labor each week, and my husband on top of that puts in another 20 to 30. And we just barely make it work. This motion had nothing to do with food security and everything to do with taxation and elitist farming. It's time to look at supporting small-scale producers in another way and making it not only attractive, but possible for young people to get into farming again. We need programming, supports, and access to things like veterinary care and medicines for livestock, and the, abil the ability to provide our products to local consumers, not increased regulations, red tape, and legislative burdens. Ms. Dowie, can I ask that you, do you have what you read to us in writing? I can send it, yeah, I kind of scribbled on this one. <laughs> okay, if you don't mind um, submitting just some comments, because this, the, the motion here that was brought forward was defeated by this council. However, it may still roll forward to the Association of Vancouver Island Coastal Communities, so it would be helpful to have the contacts for those of us that are attending that as delegates. That's one of the reasons that I really wanted to make sure that somebody came out and brought forward some of the information that was very, very greatly missing. Okay, so if you, if you could please, you could just send Absolutely. it to info at souk.ca, then it'll be circulated to all of us and we'll have that context. And if, if you don't mind including a, um, 
a phone number for just for clarity that we can reach you at that would be great absolutely okay thank you very much for taking the time tonight councillor Beddoes yeah I want to thank you for bringing those things forward uh, on that evening there was a great deal of confusion as you probably were, were able to understand I came from and, a two-hour school board meeting and watched the yeah. <laughs> anyways the, the uh, I think we're very interested in making small farming viable uh, not just for food security but I, I agree with what your comments so I appreciate your input tonight thank you thank you okay Councillor St. Pierre I'd like to point out that this was brought forward very quickly and partly because the regulations have it so we have to have any re any resolutions to AVIC <clears throat> very quickly and unfortunately there wasn't very much time to put it together because we were also doing this in joint with COMOX so it was very very quick because of that that wasn't through any efforts to try and slide anything through because honestly it has to first get through council then get through AVIC then get to UBCM and then the province can feel free to ignore it <laughs> so yeah, lots of opportunity for people to basically say we don't like this and people have been very organized around uh, You know stating their opinions around this so I don't think it would have flown under the radar by any any means uh, That was not the intent uh, The other thing I would point out Councilor is that St. Pierre this time is for the public so let's snap it up. Yes The resolution did include supports for small farmers and that we intention was to have a transitional period Thank you, Ms. Dowie. Thank you. We, we look forward to your email. Thank you. Other members of the public this evening? Seen anyone else? Nope. Okay. So we'll move on. And that brings, thank you, everyone. Uh, so that brings us into our consent agenda, which we have the correspondence from January 17th to February 4th to be received for information. Moved by Councillor Bateman, seconded by Councillor Beddoes. Question or comments? See none. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried unanimously. Okay. Item 10.1 is SIP, the South Island Prosperity Project, and the Souk Region Chamber of Commerce. So you have received delegations and materials here, and so now at this point, um, staff is looking for our direction on what we would like to progress with these. So I'll start uh, Councillor Logans. Um, I just for the moment wanted to speak specifically to the Souk Region Chamber of Commerce funding request. I'm very happy this is finally coming forward because I was shocked when that was cut <laughs> at their request. Um, one of the things that I feel is lacking from the proposal, I'm just going to go through here, is... Um, is a budget so we have a request for what our funding would contribute to but no idea or sense of what funding is already in place um, and my concern with this is things like eight thousand dollars for a contractor at fifty dollars an hour I'm not sure that like is that something that is that we a hundred percent need to put in the budget right away on a, on a year where we're I mean, we have a motion on the on the table tonight to cut a thousand dollars from the fire department for protective gear. So, is, do we want to put fifty dollars an hour towards towards that um, to a tune of eight thousand dollars? It's a bit of a struggle for me to go from zero to a hundred with an organization that declined our funding. And I understand it's it. We need to get back into that good relationship and. And I do support providing the chamber with funding, but I don't know that we should jump right into to it until we have all the details. I feel I just feel like there's a bit missing. Thank you, Councillor Logans, Councillor Beddoes, and Saint Pierre. Yeah, I, uh, I I appreciate the chamber coming. We we asked them to bring some more information, and I was very happy with the information they brought forward. Um, it was quite extensive. There was. Uh, not, not really a detailed budget of where they're going, but where their money came from, what they spent it on, and uh, a number of other things. I just want to clarify a few things. One of the uh, comments were made uh, by the chamber was that uh, uh, they were at one time promised some money from uh, our license fees, and uh, which is, we collect $65,000 a year in license fees. So I was curious as to um, we collect that money, but there's a cost in collecting that money. And I had a conversation uh, with uh, Ms. Gray there, 
uh, on uh, some of the details of what it actually cost us to the business licenses. And what I was able to determine is basically it's a wash. Uh, we, we spend about $65,000 on uh, uh, the, the, the process itself. So there isn't really a whole lot of money to hand out to anybody. Uh, and then there was a, a comment made today about um, you know what some of the traditional things that the chamber should have been doing. And they have been taken over by other organizations. Um, you know, the uh, Economic Development Group is in town. Uh, Communities in Bloom takes some of it. Uh, Visitors Information takes 24605 uh, Serta, 23979 or 29 So, unfortunately, what's happened over the years is the Chamber, through whatever reasons, has backed out of some of these things, like the, the parade, for instance, uh, they were used to do that, and then the Lions had to jump in and do it at the last minute. Uh, plus, things like the Sukarama, I mean, down there, the local businesses highlighting, the Lions are doing that. So, I, I looked at what you're proposing, and, uh, you know, annual golf tournament for $5,000, which you want us to supply, and I'm wondering who act that actually benefits. It looks like it benefits the members of the Chamber, and I think that's something that the chamber do should pay for. Uh, uh, promotional material, there's some merit there. There's the $10,000, but I'd have to be a little concerned about that $50 an hour, although that's probably uh, not a, a biggie. Uh, business strategy seminar. These are things that you've asked for to do with the, the money. Um, business strategy seminar, who benefits? Uh, and again, shouldn't that come out of association dues? So I, I do feel your dilemma here. I mean, you've been squeezed out of some of your traditional roles, and uh, I'm not so sure at this time when we're trying to shave off um, money in the budget because uh, original plan for a 6.5% increase in taxes, which is not sitting well with us, uh, to commit another 21 or $26,000. I just can't see it at this time for this project. So uh, I did look at it in great length, and I did appreciate uh, the information that was put forward, uh, but I just I can't support it at this time. Okay, thanks. The follow-up question to Councillor Beddoes? Um, in general, okay. uh, I had, uh, to Councillor Beddoes mentioned that there was a budget. I do not have a budget. I'm just wondering what I'm missing. <laughs> well, they, they did, a, I have it here. They That's did. more the... the uh, you know how much they bring in from uh, dues, but not not a budget oh, for I the see. next year, but okay. just how much they bring in, how much they pay for rent, how much they pay for. Where is that? Uh, I had it online. I think this was information that was handed out um, at the committee the committee of the whole, oh, I was and okay. then okay. Um, they bring twenty two thousand dollars, twenty two thousand two hundred seventy eight in uh, fees from uh, their gotcha. members, and I assume the members are not just suit their all of the Juan de Fuca area. And Thank there's you. And there's another 14,000 income, which uh, I'm not even sure what that means. But And then uh, they went into what they did in the last year. And uh, so uh, I'm more than willing to share that with you. Yeah, I would actually appreciate if the chamber would email it to us so that, because I know a lot of people weren't in attendance yeah. at the Committee of the Whole, but if they're able to share it with us, it would give well, us a lot more information. Good, of course, sorry, of course it's not chair, on you. I thought they did a pretty good job and gave you the information that I asked for, and I originally asked for it. It's just that it, it just doesn't substantiate uh, 20, 26,000, I can't remember. Okay, I've, I've just forwarded it to you. Okay, Councillor St. Pierre. Uh, what I've, it's been noted that we have the EDG, SIP, uh, lots of other groups at this point in time, but I think the Chamber, from what I can tell, and correct me if I'm wrong, does play a key role in terms of orientation and providing information to potential new businesses. I don't know if anyone else is actually taking up that particular role. Uh, I'm in agreement with Councillor Beddoes. I don't know if we, def if we you know, need to fund a, a golf tournament or uh, many of these other things, but I think the orientation piece that actually welcomes, provides information on you know, possible land, taxes, whatever the hell, whatever it might be, to actually assist businesses that are interested in SUC uh, is important. We don't have an EDO, and I don't know if anybody else is doing this. So I'd be interested in finding out whether or not the Chamber could pick up that piece. 
or at least we don't drop that piece. Okay, other thoughts? Councillor Bateman? Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I'd like to zoom out a bit on all this because we're, we're entering a new era of economic development in Souk, another kick at the can. You know, back in 2006, Mayor Evans launched the Souk Economic Development Commission, which lasted for six years. Um, the OCP, our current OCP, indicated that um, that Souk Economic Development Commission would be the lead agency and facilitator of community economic development moving ahead. However, it was abruptly terminated in 2012. It was followed by the uh, mayor's advisory panel. There's a lot of good notes and minutes and reports and all sorts of things developed out of those, those two organizations. Um, the key point, uh, last fri um, on Monday, last Monday it was, we had a workshop with um, uh, the provincial government, two, two ministries dedicated to economic development, and they invited us to take advantage of their consultation their, um, and their toolkits and everything else. So we've got two items on the agenda here, SIP and the region, Souk Region Chamber of Commerce. Staff report is recommending that um, we ask the chamber to seek a community grant as of the March 15th deadline. And that I would suggest that as we move forward here, we, we take out our membership in SIP, which is a big picture regional organization that also does a lot of local, um, local engagement as well. They have, um, they have access to investors, they have outreach, they have one-on-one -on -one mentoring, peer-to-peer -peer mentoring circles, uh, professional development events. Um, the, uh, the SIP is offering uh, chamber represent representatives reciprocal membership uh, in the organization, um, i.e., you know, you, they join you, you join, join SIP. Um, it strikes me that we again need, so I'm back to the, um, you know, back in December, we received a economic analysis, and its number one recommendation was, where is it, Jeff? Um, its number one recommendation was create a stakeholder group that continues to meet on a regular basis to discuss economic development initiatives. And I would think that would be our next step. Join SIP, create this stakeholder group, which would involve the chamber, a district representation, economic development group, and then slowly move forward. Ask the chamber this year to seek a community grant, and as it gets its act together, because it's gone through, I think, in a bit of a bumpy ride, I think is what Ms. Santowski noted in her report, and it's got a great new collection of individuals, give them time to prove themselves, come back to us, um, in, in six to nine months when we start looking at the 2021 budget to, again, uh, access a service agreement from the district. Okay, so, so I that was almost 10 minutes, wasn't it? It was. Okay, so your speaking time is over. Yeah. Up to 10 minutes twice. Remember, that's procedural bylaw. We all agreed. <laughs> Councillor Logans, I'll entertain a third quick because you're up to almost your Thank you. Um, I actually really like Councillor Bateman's suggestion. I think that's an excellent way to move forward, slow and steady. Um, having now taken a quick peek, so correct me if I'm wrong because I just received this at the chamber budget, there's a deficit on, in their annual, uh, in their year end of $4,400. And it's not responsible for us financially to be contributing to an organization that's in a deficit. So I believe it would be good to first become sustainable. And at that point, then we can move forward in a financial partnership. Um, that's something I've had to do in other organizations with similar budgets. So um, it's definitely that level of responsibility needs to be proven in my eyes before we can do anything. But, um, but I do really support uh, what Councillor Bateman has put forward um, because I was kind of on the edge about SIPP, but I think that sold me there. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Beddows? Uh, we have an economic development group right now, do we not? I mean, Informally, we do, yes. Informally, yes. Okay. Yep. I just, uh, you know, it's something, I haven't heard from them, but I mean, I, I know they exist out there, but uh, 
it's interesting. I, I concur with uh, Councillor Bateman. If people can get their act together and maybe these different groups deal, it'd be easier for us to deal with one entity that looks after this. So I, I okay. concur. So just thank you for the, the Councillor Lajeunesse. Go ahead. I have, I've worked with the South Island Partnership people in the past, and they are a powerhouse organization. I've worked with them through Camosun College, through my work there, and I think that uh, we should definitely have a seat at the table with that group. It's like bad manners in meetings. I just turn off the phones. I turn them all on, I guess. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor, and sorry to be disruptive here. Uh, for myself, I think it's timely for us to take out the membership in South Island Prosperity Project. We can reevaluate it in a year or a year's time, yes. much like the CRD art service that we joined. We joined that with a two-year outlook just to see, and, and then we would reevaluate it. So it's something that... Um, that it's timely for us to consider. So I am in full support of that. In regards to the chamber, and this kind of goes to some of the other groups, we're still waiting. It wasn't to the chamber. We gave out $15,000 though, almost a year and a half ago, about the whole research and analysis on the hotel tax. And at that time, it was for different groups to start working together in terms of how that tax is going to be received and distri distributed. Uh, and I appreciate that there are volunteers behind working on all of these different projects but it's timely that we sort of work together and see where is there duplications how can things be reevaluated what's timely nowadays is the printing of brochures effective now as people are looking more for online resources and apps and those sorts of things like are people browsing the internet like all of this needs to it's timely just to reevaluate them we are in a service agreement with some of the organizations so i appreciate i'm not about breaking up service agreements or any of that but there is a timeliness to these where we need to examine them uh, in terms of supporting a golf tournament, we can do things like we do for the Rotary. We sponsor a hole-in-one or we sponsor those contests. We go and we play golf. We, it would be, we would need to treat any organization that's doing something like that in the same way. I think that's a fairness element uh, in that regard, just like other sort of events that occur. So I like the idea of what Councillor Bateman said is that... Um, uh, we start with the one and then we start gathering the groups together and we evaluate but also then direct the chamber to apply for a community grant see what project they actually would like to take on and accomplish is it the newcomers guide is it the new like the new the newcomers club is it the new business orientation like which in particular would make sense to your board because you're also a volunteer organization with a lot of different pieces so what would you actually want to achieve and in some part I've sat here for many years now and have seen different folios come forward by the chamber or other groups but it's also do you have the capacity to do all these pieces and if one person drops off does it all just disappear it you want something that's going to continue on whether or not that person is there at the table and I think those are the kinds of um, things that we would want to look for we are at a point right now where we are trimming down our budget we ask staff to bring up tell us what the service level is how do we fund it and now we're like okay um, that's not affordable so adding something to it this year is difficult in years to come I think we can consider that and let's work together and develop a good plan there so that's where I would like to, I like the motion that council directs staff to attain a membership in the South Island Prosperity Project. So I'll look for a mover and a seconder for that, please. Moved by Councillor Lajeunesse, seconded by Councillor Bateman. Discussion on this, um, once this formalizes, it'll need to come to council um, and just look at who do we appoint to the table? What does the membership look like? What is the meeting schedule? That sort of thing. I don't want to make that decision tonight. I'd like us to evaluate it after we actually formally join the membership. So on the membership, Councillor St. Pierre. We have a resolution on the floor. I know we do. 
Uh, I'm interested actually in uh, the membership or making use of the Chamber of Commerce and allowing them to build their capacity with support because it's clear to me that if they're working strictly with volunteers. But we're talking about right now, the motion on the floor is a membership in the South Island Prosperity Project. So you're speaking to that resolution. That's what I'm looking for comment on. I will speak to that then. And I will say that I agree with that particular organization because it does it has a broader mandate than the Chamber of Commerce, but I think there's room to figure out what the Chamber can do. Okay. Councillor Bettles on the resolution? Yeah. Uh, what is the cost for that membership? This one is $16,400. Per year? Yes. Okay. Be interesting in when we pay that money what we get back. But we'll have a look at that in a year. I think it's the right way to go. Yeah. I'm, I'm okay with the motion. I just needed that dollar figure in my head. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Bateman? Yeah, I think this is done per capita, so Colwood, I was I heard, learned from a councillor, Colwood councillor last week pays something of the order of 60000 a year. So by being souk-sized, we get a, a discount. Not but a discount. it'll... It's a per capita. <laughs> per capita. Yeah. Okay. It's per capita. It'll grow with a growing population. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Anything else on the resolution? All those in favour? Opposed, that's carried unanimously. So the second part in terms of our direction to staff to the chamber is um, I sort of, we've all made various comments uh, and then my summary comment is that we, we recommend or suggest that the, we can't tell the chamber what to do. They're an independent organization. So we would recommend that they consider applying for a community grant project in a way that works with their board of directors and resonates with their membership. But it would be, encourage is a good one. Thank you, Ms. Temple. Uh, but it's, it's ultimately up to them. They may choose not to and that's their call to make entirely. So we have here that council encouraged the Souk Region Chamber of Commerce to apply for a community grant. Okay, Do, sound good? Anyone willing to move that? Moved by Councillor Lajeunesse, seconded by Councillor Bateman. Discussion, Councillor Logans? Uh, in our community grant program, are we allowed to fund organizations with a deficit? Well, this is where when they apply and provide all of that, um, we would discuss that, but at this, yeah, we can't, cause, cause we I'm, can't, I'm not, we can't fund a deficit. And right now I'm looking at January 20. Oh no, that was before. Yeah. I'm looking at a deficit in 2019. Oh, there it is of 1679 coming from no. Well, 2018 was a profit 2730 at the on the financials, on the financial statement, they provided us. So can I just um, get a comment back from staff, like the actual question, because we don't all have the same information I just, in and, front and of us. If I can get clarity on that, on the budget, perhaps if we could even ask Ms. Sentowski to come up, if that's okay with you, Madam Mayor, to just clarify that piece, because I just re like took a look at this. But I don't want to encourage anyone to apply for a grant and put the time and resources into that when they're not able to do it through our program. But so if this reflects otherwise, that's, then I would support the motion. That's the policy question I want answered from our staff. So because we have a new grant policy in place now, in this case, would the count would the chamber be eligible? Should they have a deficit? Could they still apply for the grant? Um, through the worship to the council, um, yes, the new. Um, policy states that if they were to apply as a project then of course they wouldn't have to um, bring forward their financials so it would be a project based uh, budget that they would show instead so in this case they could so that's fine Councillor Bettles yeah I was best you're going to say that I just encourage the, the uh, chamber to come with a specific thing that they want done and I think that will solve all our problems. Not to solve all our problems. They may not even get it. But I mean, at least something that they want to do that would fit into our criteria. So. Because we still, like our grant program is always oversubscribed, but it's just, it's an avenue that's available. And we are trying to direct all of our fundings to the grant program and not have them ad hoc throughout the year. So that's sort of where we're going with this. Okay, an amendment perhaps? A uh, quick amendment to the motion might, or a friendly amendment might be to uh, apply for community grant and sponsorships for events. 
I think we only have like, oh, sponsorships for the golf tournament. Right, yeah, right. that would be a good one. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so that's an amendment. Uh, is there a seconder for the amendment? Moved by Councillor St. Pierre. So on the amendment, and that is to add an event sponsorship. I'll call the question on the amendment. All those in favor? Opposed, it's carried unanimously. So now on the main motion as it's amended, please. Is there anything further on the main motion amended? Amended main motion. <laughs> okay, all those in favor? Opposed, it's carried unanimously. Okay, good. Thank you very much, everyone. So next item, community, pardon me, committee of the whole resolutions budget. Oh, could we have a quick short break before we get into budget? Okay, that's probably a very wise plan. So <laughs> I'd just like to entertain, or I will be just breaking us for just a few minutes for a health break. Thank you. Okay, everyone, let's um, get our attention back into the meeting, please. Okay, thank you. Welcome back. Welcome back, everyone. Okay, so we're on item 10.2, and this is our budget item here. So I see that there are several recommendations that came from the committee of the whole part. So I think um, in terms of best way to move forward here, is that we can we can see that there's recommendations from the committee and then I think it's a case of uh, we go through them one at a time, a couple at a time, all page at a time, councillor, or pardon me, Ms. Ms. Gray. 
Um, yeah, I just wanted to provide a bit of context. So at the Committee of the Whole meeting, there was kind of two different kind of conversations going on, which is why there's two separate reports about it. One was kind of more specific uh, resolutions that the councillors in attendance put forward. And then item uh, 10.3 is just more general conversations and questions that council had. So they're provided in a separate report. Um, so yeah, the first one, this was kind of clear from the, count, the four councillors in attendance that this is what they wanted to recommend. So if we could address these items first and then we can kind of see where the conversation goes from there. Okay, and I appreciate there was a lot of dialogue that was done, but um, is it the case of removing, just for clarity, like if we removed an e-bike, does that remove the need for protective clothing? Correct, yes. The first three items, the 1,500 and 500, are all related to increased cost um, for our uniform and supplies and I see. Air, bike pumps and tires, et cetera, potentially. Um, that would be required um, if the e-bike purchase went forward. So the okay. idea being it would be um, $2,000 estimated in 2020, and then 21, those costs go down to $1,000. Because we just don't know for sure. Um, once they have the uniform, we don't need to buy new uniforms. It was just that initial outlay. Yeah, no, and that's fine. I just wanted to see the the, the yeah, connection. Yes, so all three of those, all four of those ones for. go together. If the e-bike um, goes forward, then I would recommend that those come back into the budget. If the e-bike doesn't, then there wouldn't be a need to keep those three first three items in the budget. Got it. Okay. So, and then the planning consultant, the twenty-five thousand, were putting something off. Correct. That was um, an addition um, for 2020 in the planning budget, and so there wasn't. It wasn't directed to a specific uh, project or report or anything. It was just more in case there's other reports that come out through the year that the planning department might need to undertake. But um, the conversation kind of led to that if these did come up, there would be other avenues to potentially fund those through either council contingency or CAO contingency or. Okay. Um, it would just because it wasn't earmarked for anything specific. It was um, suggested that that just be deferred. Um, and could be re-examined in future if it's something that needs to get added to the planning budget in future years, potentially. And I think just for myself on that, if something were to come up, it would be just more timely to put it off. We really need to finish off the master plans and get the OCP underway. So really, rather than saying, where are we going to fund that, it'll be the case of we need to just focus on these items and divert our energy to that and then see, unless there's a grant that offsets something. But these are really essential documents that our community needs okay so because we could move like this whole thing like unless let's well in councillor Beddows. yeah we had a quite a rigorous discussion about this uh it was a very interesting afternoon um but we basically at uh, the committee of the whole this is what we recommended yes. this is what is brought forward yeah. so i'd like to see them voted on as as a unit okay councillor st pierre I have, I've looked at this uh, fairly carefully and I don't understand, um, honestly, the e-bike actually moves forward almost all of our core values and principles as agreed to in the strap plan. So we're looking at effective governance by having cheaper vehicles that keep our people healthy. We're looking at uh, promoting health and well-being of residents and employees, improving safety and accessibility on roads and trails, enhancing quality of life, developing sustainable infrastructure, long-term thinking, environmental leadership. And then we decide that for uh, what amounts to not even, it's not, a, it's not a percent, it's like a fraction of a percent, that we're going to actually go towards more costly vehicles that don't advance us into the future. Um, this is a first step towards actually moving us towards the kind of cycling infrastructure that we actually need. Uh, we need to get people out of cars. E-bikes are recognized to do so. Providing leadership and modeling that behavior is great. We have a wonderful trail system that keeps on expanding but is not always used as much as it could be. Having our own people on those trails where they can access things through e-bikes that they can't get to in a car makes sense from a safety point of view. It's cheaper. Uh, I can't support this at all. It's, uh, it's completely not what we've agreed we want to do. Other okay. than saving a little bit of money. And, and that's a very valid point. Um, we'll share that many of our staff do use the trail system as it is and don't require an e-bike to do so and not every resident at this point can afford to get an e-bike and everything that goes with it but they can afford a bicycle and I think by just encouraging everyone 
to bike to work uh, when we can on a regular bicycle is just as healthy, if not healthier, than an e-bike because you actually have to use all your own energy to, to get there and from. Can, can I respond? You can. That's just okay. my opinion. Uh, it, it's, it's a valid opinion, except what I've noticed, especially in our neighborhood where we have River's Edge, is that we have a lot of people that cannot get on a regular bike and go up hills, zooming up hills. So we have people that are no longer necessarily physically fit enough to get on a bike getting onto e-bikes. And what it's doing is it's allowing people to go up the hills in Souk, and there's a lot of hills in Souk, and get where they need to go. They can go there fast, they can go there easy. Uh, it's, it's definitely a modality that's actually in, on the rise, and moving us towards infrastructure and moving the district in a position of leadership or modeling the kind of thing that we would like our residents to be doing makes sense. It's showing that we're actually taking action in the right direction with the right form of transportation. Okay. Councillor Beddows? Yes. I mean, we've sort of been over this as another time. I understand Saint, uh, Councillor St. Pierre wasn't there. Um, I don't see anybody from uh, bylaw here to say that they really need this, and I've got the impression they really could care less whether they got it or not. Maybe I'm wrong in that assumption. But uh, I don't think they necessarily wanted it. I don't know. I don't know even know why it was in the budget. But uh, uh, these are the recommendations put through by uh, the last meeting. And uh, I think they were unanimous to put through like that. So I'd just like to move on with it. So, no, that's a good point, Councillor Beddows. It was actually me that raised it in the first place. <laughs> like one of us anyway that hey you know so it is a nice to have it didn't come from our staff so you know i think in time we'll get there so i'm comfortable with it coming out um councillor bacon yeah so um yeah i i think it was I who raised it, not that it really matters, but it came after a, C a CRD board meeting where their provisional budget included e-bikes for water uh, board staff to move around. Uh, I raised the idea of uh, bylaw, bylaw officer Scott McCallum. He, he was enthusiastic about it, I know that. Um, I think context-wise, this, this council is entered the Committee of the Whole last week determined to shave a point or perhaps even two off the proposed yeah. budget. The e-bike was the very first thing up for discussion <laughs> real fast and you know I think Councillor St. Pierre's points are all valid um, and I don't see why this can't come forward in future budgets. Yeah. Um, so that's it. Okay, so right now we have that council direct. So this is the resol this is the recommendation. So we're looking to endorse this. Um, that council direct the acting director of, or pardon me direct the director of finance to make the following adjustments to the budget uh, for consideration with the third reading of the five year financial plan bylaw number seven hundred twenty twenty. Remove the one thousand for protective clothing from bylaw. Remove the five hundred for supplies from bylaw. Remove five hundred for vehicle maintenance from bylaw. Remove the three thousand two hundred for an e-bike from bylaw. Remove the twenty five thousand for a planning consultant. So I'm looking for a mover. Moved by Councillor Beddows, a seconded by Councillor Lajeunesse. Anything further on this block here? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed, that's carried unanimous. Councillor St. Pierre is opposed, otherwise it's carried. Okay, uh, slide two please. So here we have, okay, this was deferred for the bluff staircase, 150,000 for the bluff case, staircase. And we received some information here from our staff. This is mainly uh, used by the, the, the users or the residents within this particular area. We do have issues with parking. Uh, an assessment was done in 2019. It's a medium risk staircase. So it's something that we will need to replace at some time. It's not closed like we've had other staircases completely closed and hamper considerable access to the community. So I think it is something that we plan for. I think what I would like to see in this, in the interim, is the case of that we do consider, we do need to plan for replacement of this. In the meantime, though, let's see what we can work out to make improvements with parking in this area. 
or bicycle storage. Councillor St. Pierre. I love the idea of both. Uh, based, on, <laughs> based on the ideas that were brought forward at the earlier presentation, it sounds like uh, one of the issues in infrastructure for cycling is also parking for, for bicycles. And I'd be interested in, to know whether or not the casino money that was in this can actually be shifted over to providing uh, parking stubs to lock up bikes through our park system. Not throughout, because 150 doesn't go that far, but I'm just curious. Yeah. But I think that, that those are recommendations that, that I will be looking for in a new Parks and Trails master plan. So we hear about parking. So I ride my bicycle. There's a bicycle lockup. It has to be safe parking, because I don't want to lock my bike to something and then have harvesting happen to it while I'm inside the store. So it's the case of, as we look at our Parks and Trails master plan, where are people going, where location-wise makes the most sense to have spots, and then we start prioritizing them. So if the majority of users of this particular staircase are already walking from home because it's right there, uh, maybe that's not the draw. But Whiffin Spit Park, I could see that as being more of a priority of, of <laughs> places, or John Phillips Memorial Park, where mm -hmm. there's absolutely nothing. Oh, yes. <laughs> and where we want to drop people in, or the boardwalk, or other points in and around town where we have some lands. So those, I think, will be some elements that we'll see come up in the parks and trails. We'll have an opportunity, even with contingency or here of a grant, like here, let's put four, four into John Phillips right now or, and, and do something there. Just a quick question for clarification on the funding. Uh, is the funding that's in, like the, this, this is not tax funded in the majority from what I understand. Do we simply lose this funding? Can this funding be reassigned? How does that work exactly? So I'll direct that to our finance director. Um, through your worship, so in regards to the Bluff Staircase project, it's currently funded with three different reserve funds. So either th if the project didn't go forward, then that money would just go back into the reserve funds and it could be reused for different projects, but there's, it depends on how the other recommendations go and then basically after the conclusion of this I was going to take all of those and then make any necessary changes so potentially they could get repurposed to other projects um, but at the time if this didn't go forward they would just go back into the reserve fund so and then we'll, we have some reserves Councillor Bettos one of, one of the, the discussions we talked about the bluff staircase is, is because it is sort of controlled by the strata there and there is no park and there is no place to uh, it wasn't worth spending $150,000 unless the residents there came up with some plan that we could have a few parking spots or park a bicycle. And one of the options that we discussed was just to close it off. I mean, it's a lot of money to pay for something that's so seldom used. So I just wanted to clarify that did come up and we did discuss it at length. That's great. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Bettos. Um, Councillor St. Pierre. Uh, another suggestion that came up in previous council was um, a memorial staircase to see whether or not we can actually fund it through a legacy type of system. And I, I'm still interested in seeing whether or not that would be possible, having a plaque on each step and maybe going towards something more durable than wood. But that would require more work from staff, I would imagine. It, it would. Uh, I think in this case, um, this is where with the Parks and Trails master planning, like those documents are important because then we can start to then prioritize where infrastructure goes. We know that we want to do draw more people into John Phillips. So we, we want to look at that and then we may have a reserve fund to do it. So, okay, so what I'm hearing, our Councillor Bateman on the staircase. Yeah, so I see the, the Municipal Insurance Authority has determined medium risk, which I suspect means it's it's usable for the next year or two or three or four until it reaches high or extreme risk, which would be a sad day if someone went falling through those stairs. But my, my main point there is so it's medium risk at this time. We can shelve the idea of replacing those stairs for now. And I'm very interested in seeing the recommendations of the Parks and Trails Master Plan. Where does it fit on the priority list? Yeah. Simple as that. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So what I'm hearing is then that Council, oh, Council Lajeunesse. Yeah, um, I was at a inclusivity conference last week. And um, the staircase, it's kind of on the fringe of the, of the community. And it's not something that I would be using anytime soon. But what I would like to see is, is that money redirected into a more central location like John Phillips or something like that. And maybe we can 
make some improvements that are going to be used by more people. The Little River Crossing comes to mind um, because that is one where um, we could actually create a fully accessible pathway for all abilities. And I think that would be a really good opportunity to showcase that. And it does connect a lot of people back and forth. Councillor Bettos. I'd, I'd be willing to make a motion that we remove this from the budget. Okay, so that is that council removed the 150000 for Bluff Staircase with the 2020 within the 2020-2024 five-year financial plan bylaw. Moved by Councillor Beto, seconded by Councillor St. Pierre. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Opposed, it's carried unanimously. So our direction is we'll get more of this through the Parks and Trails Master Plan, reevaluate. The next part is the, the EV chargers uh, and the 212,000. So we got some information here. Um, Ms. Gray? If you wanted to elaborate a bit more on this here. Um, sure. Um, so just a general comment too about any of these uh, recommendations going forward is because this budget is still draft, like there is still, would still be time to add new projects to the budget before it's finally adopted. So um, for me and uh, myself, I'm just looking for a bit of direction on some of the bigger ticket items so then I can, you know, confirm what the new property tax rate potentially might be and what the balance in the reserves would be. So then if new projects come forward before this is finally adopted, we'll have a clearer picture of where we're sitting at currently so you can make an informed mm -hmm. decision going forward. Um, so in regards to the EV chargers, uh, we had our staff just provide a bit of additional information to council because it was quite the hot ticket um, conversation um, th as well through the survey, just um, trying to understand it. So because of this project, the way it is in our budget, um, we applied for a specific grant for it. So there was very clear criteria in the grant of what it was. So um, if there was conversations about changing um, the way that maybe incentivizing different, funding this a different way, I believe, um, or doing something different with, the, with, through businesses. Yeah, like funding businesses to install chargers um, at their locations. So if that was going to be council's desire, then that, that would make us ineligible for this grant. So then the remain, if we were successful in the grant, we would have to kind of decline it um, and then potentially could use the district portion that was already earmarked of 75,000 towards another EV charger type project if that's what council chose to do with it. So it was just um, staff just provided a bit more information on what the grant was about and um, a bit of historical information on it. So we're just looking for some guidance on do we still want to keep this project? We're still pending um, information on if we were successful for the grant at this stage. So I don't know if we we're going to be successful. Um, so just a question is um, the 212 would that would that be what the grant is for? Uh, 137 I believe is the grant portion okay. and 75 is the district portion. I see. Okay. Councillor Beddoes. Yeah, just going back again to the discussion we had uh, there was a very good point made about, um, you know, should we be putting in the chargers or should we be offering a subsidy to businesses in the community to put in a charger if they're willing to put in a charger? And there was some merit to that because the, the people that uh, would want to charge uh, are not necessarily going to those spots that we can control. And it'd be a better fit if, uh, like, A&W had one. If they wanted to put one in and we offered them a ten thousand dollar so there was some discussion around that and uh, I'm inclined to uh, go that direction so uh, that was just just to bring those members that uh, those councillors that weren't here that time that did come up and that was one of the uh, a good talking point which I thought was very good well and since I'll just jump in like since we were talking about EV chargers the, the landscape is changing quite quickly. So Village Foods has installed two already. The uh, the new Evergreen Mall, they're putting in four or six? Four, four are going in there. Um, sea Park has two. Uh, the Prestige has one, I believe. The Harbour House has a couple. They've had them for a while. Selk already has had one for a long time. So we didn't have any in the town centre initially when this whole thing started, and we were trying to look at where they went. And then... Council of the time was firm that they had to be on district property. We couldn't put them onto um, property that we don't own. So that's where these locations emerged. 
uh, and then we do now now the businesses in the town center are putting them in or have already installed them so things are changing a little bit so councillor Logan's then to councillor st. Pierre uh, no you just read my mind that's pretty much what I was going to bring up was that history piece um, but one of the things that I also wanted to bring up was that we um, like in the report we do have that twin unit already mm -hmm. that that we have waiting to install um, and since there have been a lot already uh, installed in the community I don't think it's really appropriate to start using the $75,000 to supplement new ones and and not really reward the people who have yeah like championed that in our community um, but but if we did want to keep that 75,000 budget allocation I might put want to put it towards installing that new the EV charger we do have that's been sitting for two years <laughs> well and I think that would be the costing thing because that's where the Eustis location would make the most sense to install that because there are so many businesses in that particular area the Legion the community hall are all user groups that are in and out uh, and there's like the two um, when you go down Eustis Road there's two parking stalls that are together so it was identified that because that's where the hydro line is that those would be the best would make the most sense uh, to be EV spots and then a lot of people that are in and out of that area would benefit so we have it in the box I mean my my thing would be to use some of that and that is exactly that's option two in here is to do that Councillor St. Pierre, because the other ones we were looking at, I think, were here um, at McGregor Park, um, some of the other sort of park space, which also out of sight, out of mind. We'd have to patrol it. I really appreciate the idea of using incentives to actually, you know, get businesses putting these things in. Uh, I am curious as to whether or not there'd be anything left over of 75000 after installing at Eustis. Uh, and I'd be interested in seeing if that money could be set aside for some sort of an incentive, small, very small incentive program. Uh, that would be lovely. Uh, the other thing that occurs to me is that at some point the district is probably going to want to move towards EV vehicles itself or its fleet. And it might make sense to have chargers wherever that's going to be, whether it be, you know. And I'm curious whether or not the library is going to have chargers. That would be uh, something to, to find out. So around lot A, are we going to have anything around lot A? But anyway. Uh, in theory, I think that uh, the additional chargers at the cost don't necessarily make as much sense as they could, and I do like the idea of incentives, if we can actually make that a real thing. The other thought would be, I, like I want is to, inst do we install the charger here? Because then if there was an electrical, of electric vehicle put in, then you would be able, the staff would be able to charge it here, which makes sense. Um, and then for members of the public that would either be using John Phillips Park or coming in, I don't know. That's that's sort of an engineering technical question. There's a lot of hands. Yeah, Councillor yeah, Bateman. Yeah. Here, because I, I did, you and Councillor St. Pierre and Logan's missed this last week, but I did read the, the minutes of May 14th, 2018, when the 77,000 was assigned to this project. And the, the Staff report at the time, the estimate for all six chargers and wayfinding signage is $63,000. So there's an answer. So there's 63,000, and I assume these are level two chargers. I'm, I'm still not clear after the report tonight uh, what the extra grant funding will in fact pay for the 137,000, if uh, indeed we get it. Through your wish, I believe I wasn't here at the time for the 2018 report, but um, in my understanding, talking to the staff member, was that was the estimate, and then we got some actual quotes in, and they were significantly higher, which was why then the decision was made to just purchase the two chargers and then look at other grant opportunities, and this grant opportunity came up, and so they caught, that's, that was the initial staff estimate of what it was going to cost, and then I believe we got a quote that was significantly higher of what it would cost to actually install these because of the hydro and other... Um, hookup things that you need were, were a lot more expensive so then that's why grant opportunities were pursued and then this one was found so then again that's partially why they've been sitting because part of the grant is you can't start any work on this until you are 
awarded or not awarded the grant, otherwise you become ineligible. So, um, so that's the, the difference in the price. It's just that was the initial ballpark, and then um, actual quotes came in that were significantly higher, which kind of caused staff to pause for a minute and just at least purchase the equipment and then hold off on the next steps. Councillor Be uh, Beddoes. <laughs> Just one last little comment. We had a very interesting discussion from a member of the community uh, who pointed out that uh, the people that have electric cars in the community will have a charger at their house. Yes. They don't necessarily come downtown to charge. The charges that we would have to put in our community would be to service those people that come from Victoria or Nanaimo and things like that, which, again, it's better handled by the private sector than us putting one here. They're not going to come and visit us. So just a just comment. Councillor St. Pierre, so the use of this location makes more sense. Yes. Yeah. yes, for sure. I would entirely agree again with that. And I would point out that uh, my feedback from people that use electric cars, uh, even more so than I have, because I has been in the shop for about a month, oh. uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> got rear-ended, oh. is that two chargers is not generally sufficient, especially in an area of high traffic. Uh, so it might be worthwhile to see whether or not the local business owners would be interested in uh, ponying up to actually have, you know, maybe up to four to six, and that a bank of more chargers makes more sense, especially in a high usage area. Yeah, so but the challenge when we looked at the Eustis is it's so tight for parking there and where the hydro is. Mm. So, the, like, just no, say, like, and that's where there was basically two identified, which is why, you know, Evergreen with the rezoning is putting in four. So that makes the most sense. But in this case, where the hydro line is, and when you just look at the multitude of uses in that particular area. I would simply recommend yeah. that if it's possible at all, given that the power's already be there, the work's already going in, if you can add extra chargers at a site, it makes sense. If it doesn't make sense for this site, there's no that's parking. Fine. If, there's, if it's not available, that's the way it goes. Yeah, like just physically, there's no, there's no, there's no parking. There's two spots, so that would make the most sense. Okay, so I'm sort of hearing that uh, council is comfortable um, progressing to install the twin charger set that we have on Eustis. Okay, so that council include. Okay, now we have to sort of look at this here. That council directs staff to progress with two, the twin chargers at the Eustis Road location. Progress with the installation of twin chargers at the Eustis Road location. And then I think you need to do the math and work the rest out. And well, and that's where if we apply for two instead of the others, then what that does to the grant, I don't entirely know. Like we, we need their feedback. Right? Uh, I believe we have to withdraw from the grant process if we're going to move on installation. The grant requires us to not have begun any work. I right, so it's whole new chargers. Whereas we have to, or do we, do we, does some grant money qualify for the installation of these things? Like um, I'm not sure, because it, it would change the way the grant was submitted. You had to submit some specific plans and intentions. Okay. So I'd have to get some clarity on if it was just going to be a matter of installing the two that we've already purchased. I'm not sure if that would be eligible um, for It would the be grant. good to know. We might so, qualify for something for the installation yeah. of it, so we should ask. Right? Yeah. No? Yes? No? Yeah? I think so. <laughs> I'm like, no? Okay, Councillor St. Pierre? Just a very quick question to your worship to staff. Uh, are these the fast chargers? I know this was answered before, I think, but are these the fast chargers? Yeah? No? Why not? Because at 12,400, it sounds like they're more expensive than the Type 2, so I'm assuming they're fast chargers? It's I believe, yes, they're fast chargers. That was why they are more expensive than the, the regular chargers. We should have that confirmed, though, just like yeah. what kind of a charger are we installing? Because if it's like the slowest, longest one, then maybe that's not a good location, yeah. just so we know, right? Yeah. Right, six hours charged, yeah. not a good place for them. Councillor Yeah, Bateman. I did mention that earlier. And so maybe we can defer this until Mr. Butterfield is here because this is a, one of his uh, major projects. He's well, I think what we want to do is... At we third reading, we perhaps could have uh, this decided then. We want staff to have the direction that we're only going to do these... I'm, I'm hearing no to all of them. We're only going to do these two. So let's just get staff rolling with that and they'll 
amend the rest. I don't want to delay this whole conversation because okay. we know that we're going to narrowing down on these two only. And whatever grant, if we need to withdraw, we'll do it at that time. If we're eligible for some, we'll do it on that time. We'll get that feedback. Um, correct, through your worship. Yeah, if, if that's council's uh, request is to just focus on the two chargers that we currently have and how to install those, I can connect with uh, Mr. Butterfield and just confirm if that portion of just the installation would be eligible for a modified grant or if that makes the whole grant ineligible and then just confirm the revised costing yeah. um, and include that in the amended version of the budget yeah. for further discussion. Perfect. Okay. So looking for a motion. Okay. Moved by Councillor Logans that Council direct staff to progress with the installation of twin charges at the use of World location. Seconded by Councillor St. Pierre. Further discussion? All those in favour? Opposed? It's carried unanimously. Good. Okay, so the next part is about 30000 for the fire consultant master plan. Um, so through your worship, this um, came up in conversation at the last meeting. So um, Chief Mount, um, and Deputy Chief Barney have provided some information in the supplementary agenda for the next three items. So um, just probably best to deal with them separately because they're all individual items. Um, so the first one was about the $30,000 addition to the budget for uh, fire consultant master plan. Okay, over to Chief, please. Thank you, Worship, and good evening, Council. Um, we've provided 11 documents, kind of had to scramble from the committee the whole meeting there. and. What you'll see on this particular item is uh, a master plan concept for the fire department as well. Uh, I've heard quite a bit of the uh, word master plan uh, this evening. Uh, it's something that's uh, kind of been in the works uh, for a couple of years. And we included the one 10 minute response time report for your reference that was done a couple of years ago, just to provide an indication of kind of the complexity of how all these different kind of outstanding items are need to be kind of done in harmony, uh, the concept of a master plan. And you, you also see a bit of a snippet of how an RFP would uh, be constructed, you know, before it would go out. So that's for your review, that package there. So if you have any questions, I can do my best this evening. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much for, for that and also the, the materials. Um, just in terms of myself, it's just sort of focusing on finishing a couple of plans like the OCP and the transportation plan like is this something we can consider funding next year so while we focus all of our attention on our other master planning documents oh your worship uh, there's really the three items in here and and if I was to prioritize uh, them I'd look at uh, you know the car one replacement is almost uh, pretty much a safety issue and then we do have uh, some paid on call members in here that uh, are more of our senior members that drive electric vehicles as well and uh, they're just here to express their support of the paid on call system as well. So those two are definitely a priority. I could sit down with the CAO and look at some alternative options as far as what we'd like to do as far as a work plan. Yes. With some of these reports and we could defer this to next year and uh, it wouldn't have an impact compared to the other two items. Okay. Okay. Councillor Logans. Um, thank you for that question. I was going to ask the same thing, to be honest. It's not at all that I don't want this to happen because I certainly do, but, um, but if we can defer it, <laughs> that would be really helpful, I think, Chief. Thank you. In terms of the um, paid on call, um, I fully support that program. I think that it's too early uh, to see, like, we're, we're seeing good recruitment. We're seeing that, I'm, I'm pleased that three women are in the recruit class and we already have a, a woman that's finished. It's not, no disrespect to the men. But we are only, we've only been drawing from one half of our population for a long time. And so when we talk about recruiting, it's like, okay, you know, and I always sort of ask this question, um, well, where are the women? Like, you're missing. So what barriers are preventing women from becoming volunteers? And, and what does that look like? So those are really important conversations to have. We have it in local government. Where are the women? Why aren't they serving? We have it uh, in numerous places. So in this case... Uh, perhaps whatever that has been done with the paid on call has eliminated a barrier because now we have one woman that's fully trained we have three more in the program and women will attract other women I mean that usually is the case so again I fully support the men I'm not saying that that you're not amazing because you all are but again like we're missing half the population and meanwhile we have 
fire chiefs in other communities that are women and women in other places, whether it's RCMP and all these things. And we just, which I think is great because I think in a growing community where we need to um, pull out as many potential volunteer opportunities as possible when it's only been one half, we need to, we need to be more diverse in that way. So uh, in terms of the paid on call, like talking to other small or mid-sized communities in BC, they're fully staffed. They've gone from full volunteer to full career staff. And it's really expensive. And it's not that we don't appreciate or recognize the work of the paid crew, we most certainly do. But um, if we can find a way to keep our volunteers engaged and not go to a full career staff department, uh, I think that, that that is good. So we're still very competent. We have our career staff. We have our paid on call. We have our volunteers. It's growing in numbers. So I think this is a real positive one. I, I would be very hesitant in removing or interfering with that program. Councillor uh, Point of order. Yes. Um, we've been going through these one, two, three, four. I just wanted to clarify if we're going to vote on four and then move to five or six or. Oh, I sorry, because the chief okay. was speaking on those. I just yes. jumped in without even looking at the slides. So and I didn't want to interrupt you because it was very a good. <laughs> okay, because we got like number one, the chief kind of answered. It fell off, and then uh, I went into paid on call because. Um, can I move? Can I move the first? Yes, and then we can go to pay it on call, and then just okay. Let's do that. So <laughs> if if we're okay with that, um, so the first one is that council remove the thirty thousand for the fire consultant master plan with within the twenty twenty uh, twenty twenty to twenty twenty four five year financial plan bylaw. Moved by Councillor Logans. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Bateman. So. Discussion. I saw your hand first, Councillor Bateman. Okay, so anything further on removal of this? We're hearing from the chief that he's going to work with our CEO this year. We'll see if it needs what it needs to return back to next year or not, maybe. Okay. Councillor St. Pierre. Just a quick question. Uh, removal, does that mean that it, I mean, we talked about putting it to next year? Defer. So it's still in the plan. It's just next year, I assume? Or? What I heard the chief said is that he's going to be discussing having more conversations with our CAO on, on what options may exist. So maybe we'll see something different return. Okay. So that's why I use the word remove. But we can, you might have heard differently. Councillor Logan? And I, I was hesitant on that as, at first as well because I'm, I'm comfortable looking at it again next year. We do have the opportunity to look at it again next year, so I would encourage the chief to bring that forward if it's, if it's necessary. However, um, I think it is good to remove it at this time um, because of, uh, as our mayor suggested, focusing on the OCP and getting that done. <laughs> so if we, can, if we can keep our focus there for now uh, and, and remember this and, and bring it back next year if necessary. As needed, it may take a different form, okay? All right, so I'll call the question then. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried unanimously. So the other one that I heard the chief say is, um, is that car one for safety reasons is a priority and then also support for the paid on call. So we'll go to the discussion on car one, Councillor Beddoes and Lajeunesse. Okay, we'll leave that. Car one, Councillor Lajeunesse. Um, <clears throat> I don't... I don't want to see any of our district vehicles parked on the side of the road broke down, especially not emergency vehicles, and I think the chief needs to have a reliable vehicle. Okay, Councillor Logans? Um, just a question, and I sincerely apologize if I missed this in the report. I threw you to the chief. Uh, the, replace, the car one, is that going to our other department? Your Worship, to the Councillor, uh, that is correct. Uh, it's to be reallocated to bylaw. So my question then to Council is why are we giving a vehicle with a safety issue to bylaw? Because regardless, then we could have a vehicle on the side of the road with our name on it. Yes. Um, through Your Worship, uh, the concept is that it's not safe for emergency use and it's all about downtime. So that's why we have that figure there to kind of indicate downtime as being a, a major concern. There's no real bylaw emergency. So, you know, it, if, it's, if it's down for bylaw reasons, there's other means of, you know, dealing with the customer service side of things. 
uh, and it's just looking at the, the better picture of getting another three years of use, uh, expecting 15 years out of it. Thank you. Okay, so Councillor Beddoes. Yeah, on, on the vehicle, first of all, my understanding is that uh, there was like $600 worth of repairs on the brakes, and then supposedly it's fixed, and now it's not fixed, and we paid $600 for the brakes. I, I can't. I, I, I want to know what's wrong with this vehicle that it is so unsafe for you, and yet it's okay to send to bylaw. If if it's that bad, uh, we shouldn't be sending it to anybody. Yes, your worship, to Councillor Beddoes, it, it's really was I was trying to explain all about being usable and not having any downtime and and good for emergency use. There's significant requirements on emergency vehicles being available and and confidence that they're going to start right away. Uh, this vehicle could likely be put into a, a maintenance uh, package that would be good enough for bylaw use and not have those requirements of needing to be up all the time as far as turning it on at 2 in the morning and having to respond to an emergency from your home. Those are the type of uh, issues that we need to have confidence in, in our vehicles. As far as the brakes go, I believe the CVI inspection, I'd have to confirm with finance, was about 2000 dollars in total. Uh, the brakes had to get done a couple times because we had some dragging issues with calipers and uh, at the community the whole meeting um, when I, I drove it in it was actually a, a parking brake that was stuck so I had some concerns with it and I was able to troubleshoot it and and, and monitor it and uh, just continuing monitoring it right now that uh, it was just stuck being parked overnight. I'm still unclear why this is un why is it what are the other problems you're saying you're having you can't start it at home so I mean is what does the mechanic say about that I mean it's uh, these to me should have been easily rectified so, so as you'll see in in the report here through, through the chair is that a lot of emergency vehicles typically have a seven-year maintenance type of uh, replacement cycle we're at about 12 years now with these vehicles and you start seeing increased uh, amount of maintenance requirements at about the 10-year time frame and this is coming from our, you know, emergency vehicle technician and our, our captain and maintenance and equipment. Uh, the list that you see in the package is showing as much information that we, we had to kind of provide with a quick turnaround. Uh, it's been down a series of times over the last three plus years that uh, I've been driving it. And it's at the point where a few times I don't have confidence that it's going to start for me in the morning. And we've systematically been repairing things as they come. So we've replaced batteries several times, dealt with parasitic battery loss, replaced the wiper motor, uh, put in better headlamps when they, they failed, and then the CVI inspection uh, indicated a couple major issues. So it's like any vehicle while trying to stay on top of it and maintain it properly. It's just been an unreliable substandard vehicle. Councillor Beddoes? Yeah, I, you know, what frustrates me about this is uh, why wasn't this uh, information available at the last meeting? Because uh, all I heard from the last meeting is that there was a brake problem, that it was $400 spent. Uh, that's it. So it's a little frustrating to me to have you come here again and uh, outlay a, a number of other problems. The batteries aren't working and the chargers aren't working and things like that. It would have been awful nice to have that information there. So. I will support a new vehicle, but I'm just a little bit perturbed that that information wasn't forthcoming. Through, through your worship, Councillor Beddoes, actually during our long-term apparatus replacement plan presentation, we actually went in detail with every single unit in its ex uh, life expect expectancy. And we pushed this one another year because there was greater issues with Unit 209, which is our battalion unit, which is driven more often by our paid-on-call members uh, as an evening duty officer vehicle. So there's priority to actually deal with that vehicle since we had some uh, piston failure and uh, a whole host of other issues. Our whole uh, replacement and our strategy with our fleet is to have better, more reliable vehicles. And what I've seen now with the uh, new ones that we've come in, this is our last one of the legacy substandard units and we shouldn't be looking at any utility trucks till two, 2029. Yeah, I, I appreciate all that. I mean, uh, if, you, if you think that we're going to remember back to your original presentation and every little detail, we're not. And uh, if that information was uh, forthcoming at the last meeting, uh, I would have been a lot happier. But it's here now, I understand it, and we can move on.
Councillor St. Pierre, then I'll go to Lajeunesse, and then Bateman. Microphone. I was going to move that we include the 65K for the replacement of car one for fire with the 2020 2024 five year financial plan bylaw. Okay, include. so that's being moved by Councillor St. Pierre. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Lajeunesse. Okay, anything further to add, Councillor St. Pierre? Um, no. Okay, Councillor Lajeunesse, there's a motion now on this on the replacement car. Anything to add? No, only that um, just looking at the list of issues that this thing has, it, it's a lemon. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, and like low, low oil pressure, there's a couple instances where it had low oil pressure, excessive valve train wear, it's, it's used up. Okay, Councillor Bateman? No, that's fine. Chief, if you could remind me, I just saw like in the history here, something about it was a, a legacy from the Olympics. I don't re remember that. That's correct. Uh, from what I understand, that was uh, bought as a used unit uh, post Olympics and it was likely one of the kind of flagship vehicles to kind of paint a green movement for the Olympics. So there was a fleet of them and it more than likely was purchased at a discount rate, but not specified and had the proper specification as an emergency vehicle. So it's kind of had um, pretty hard use for that type of uh, vehicle. Um, definitely has a substandard transmission. It doesn't right. off-road well and it couldn't tow either, being a hybrid unit, uh, early kind of pioneer hybrid truck unit. Um, just not meant for, um, you know, the type of emergencies. What it's done well for me is idling at scene on an incident. That's one <laughs> okay. of its, its best features. For sure. Okay, so that's where it, it was used in the Olympics. We acquired it as a discount. It's 10 years old. And yeah, I think it's the case that um, should it go to bylaw, they, they need to monitor this because it's, to me, like, and I'm not a mechanic, but you hit a point where you, it'll start to cost a lot of money. And in our car that had a battery issue, it was the alternator that went, and then it was like a series. It wasn't the brake pads, it was the calipers, and it was the footings, and it was this, and then it was the e-brake, and then the whole electric, it was just shot, right? So it's gonna hit a point where this thing is, I don't wanna see our bylaw finishing up at, at a time where maybe, you know, they're leaving and they're like, okay, I'm really glad to leave this now and now they, they can't start their vehicle in, in a situation that may have not have gone that great. So it really needs to be monitored and, and it's time for maybe it just needs to go and then we can entertain um, bikes for bylaws next there year. You <laughs> just, there you go, okay. So this is moved and second and I'll call the question then, all those in favor, opposed, that's carried unanimously so the vehicle stays in. Maybe it should be truck one instead of car one, but that's just something. Okay, the next one is the fire department's paid on call. Councillor Beddows, you've been waiting to talk about that. Yeah, well, since I'll stay on the same, I'm, I'm kind of ticked, actually, because um, at no time at that meeting were we questioning the paid on call as a viable program, and yet that's how it seems to have come forward, and that was never the intent the, the intent was to get some information on some budget items when we go from 53 to 99,000 for volunteer performance incentive paid on call. So I asked for some explanations as to why that was, and I was promised some documentation to that effect. It didn't say that I don't believe in the paid on call because I do. So All sorry, that might have been how I framed it. I'm well, sorry. Well, that's how so it sort of presented because that's not the that. case. I have a legitimate question about two uh, line items, actually three line items here, and I would like them answered. So that's it. And uh, you know, we've gone from fifty-three thousand three hundred thirty-nine to ninety-nine thousand. That's quite a jump. So I would ask for an explanation as to why that is. And I asked it when we had a presentation last year, uh, at, uh, Deputy Chief, uh, yeah, I know his name so well, but I can't think of the moment, uh, uh, gave us a year by year progression on the paid on call. And so all I was looking here was to find out what they get paid per call, per fireman, and I know it changes depending on their qualifications, and why we've gone from 53,000 to 99. That's my question. It's not questioning the validity of the paid on call. And that seems to be how it's being framed. And I don't like that. 
Fair enough. Uh, through your worship to Councilor Bedos, I, th I think it's probably because it's in the context of the budget review and it's just being lumped in with several items that are being removed and that's probably the perception that it's, it's getting that it's under pressure. I'm not understanding you. If I could help clarify, I just think because it's, uh, you know, being brought up for discussion with material that's packaged with other items that are getting removed from a budget is likely why I've had questions coming to me from, you know, membership in the community that uh, why is this up uh, for discussion now when, you know, had an implementation plan in place. There, it's, it's more likely just where and how it's packaged there. So there's no intent from the fire department to say that council's not supporting it. Um, we provided a package here to uh, best as possible in the short period that we had last week to give you as much info on it that was presented in past uh, council and orientation meetings. I still have my questions. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Councillor Bettles, because well, you, you had specific questions I that did. you'd like answered. So, okay. and, and again, I'm, I'm frustrated with this, and uh, you know, you have a couple of your call on uh, people here, and I find that a little bit intimidating, but I don't know why that is, but they're entitled to come to a council meeting. I just asked a specific, simple question. If you can explain why it last year it was 53,339, and this year it's 99,000. So uh, through the chair, um, the package, I hopefully explained it as best as possible. Um, it really has to do with, with the implementation plan. And that is the addition of um, having members uh, this year, you know, in the budget uh, attending and being qualified for remuneration with respect to Thursday practice. That, and that's the jump. And that's why you see the, the package showing what uh, Deputy Barney had produced there. He did his best to work with the, the numbers and estimate to give an indication of what that would cost, and that's what that spreadsheet is, is showing. Again, that spreadsheet, is the sp I didn't see it in that package. Was it in there? It would be in the new business materials. Um, Page 37 no. of 44. Is you, okay. I'm not sure um, which page, Councillor ba Bateman? Well, 30, 35 of 44. 37? I have mine. Mean Sorry? Page 37 of 44 in the supplementary package is what I have in front of me. And in that, you'll see a 2020 breakdown and highlighted in bold is where it got to the 99K mark. And that's where it's showing incident calls plus the Thursday training. So what, what you're telling me then is that the reason why it's bumped up is because you've added a new element and that's the Thursday's training? That's correct. And that's part of the implementation plan that was uh, presented uh, early on. And then there's a subsequent jump the following year which attempts to capture the actual uh, pro uh, evening uh, weekend training time. So the whole intent with the paid on call system wasn't really a saving thing. It was, it was always an expectation of new additional cost. And the phased in approach with the implementation plan was to scale it. So it's easier to digest and um, also was aligned with some reductions in some of our critical equipment uh, SCPA plan as well. That was declining down significantly. You couldn't have told me that last week? I'm sorry, Councillor Meadows, uh, we were caught off uh, uh, guard with that, those questions and I didn't have all these numbers in front of me to give you that uh, precise answer. I did my best to explain it to you, but uh, now I have it here as a package and hopefully that's given you and satisfactory that, info. What's the rationale between the volunteer duty crew 32 to 56, the same thing? The th uh, 32 to 56 is part of the implementation plan that is covering the addition of uh, the six o'clock to 10 p.m. shift with two members. So that's just an addition of uh, um, another four extra hours is where that cost is. And we did our best to also show what we paid out for 2019. And we were actually under budget than what we actually projected there. And that one page qualifier report at the start kind of is showing where our number's at and uh, where we expect to be in the, the month of January as well. 
And the last of the questions I asked is, uh, what, what does a fireman get per hour when he's called out? Now, I've seen some figures in here, and I'm hearing different things, so maybe you could just please explain that to me. Certainly. So if I refer you to the actual standard operating guideline that uh, is um, indicating the rates, and that is on page 25 of 44. So if we go into the actual paid on call firefighter remuneration uh, section, we have a breakdown there that goes from 75% to 35%. Um, I, um, Deputy Barney probably has those figures uh, you know, right in, on, on the tip of his tongue. But uh, starting with the auxiliary standby probationary member at the bottom there, that's on page 26 of 44. That would be starting at $15 an hour. And then if you're a qualified company officer, that's getting uh, to about $31 an hour. And uh, Deputy Barney, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, the, the probationary Sorry, Deputy, um, can you Sorry. move to a microphone? Yeah. Uh, Council Brothers, through your worship, yeah. So they're all based on there. So the probationary standby rate for the call is fifteen eighty-five an hour, which is the minimum wage. Um, our level one firefighters are at twenty-one dollars an hour. Our level two firefighters are at thirty, and then apparatus operators are at a thirty-one seventy-five, and then our company officers are at thirty-two dollars an hour. Thank you. That answers your questions, Councillor. Yeah. Okay. We're still miffed, but that's fair. okay. I think just what helps, you know, and this is sort of not to just the fire department, but to all staff, because you're all working in this every day it it's like you're very familiar with the information so when we come in with a council like we remember some of it it's all like in our mind palace somewhere in the archives uh, but then we are bombarded with everything else so sometimes it's just finding a way to retrieve that but now that all the information is consolidated if there's some way that that could be packaged it's almost like we need some sort of SharePoint on the website where all this information can be loaded because then the way it works for us we have to take these agendas slip away and new ones come in and they disappear so unless we save them all into iBooks and then remember that we've done that and have the memory to store them it's it gets hard to retrieve like it's all in here somewhere but that's just that's the reality that we live in as elected officials because we deal with everything and then some all the time and then it, it doesn't mean that you don't but you're professionals in your work and and we're not does that help not just for you but for all staff so you, you need to help us help you yeah, your worship we completely understand that and uh, our apologies from the fire department if we can explain that quickly in the committee the whole meeting to Councillor Beto so Hopefully you got the information now. Okay, so I have a speaking order. You're, you're good for information? Okay. Um, I guess with that, it's, it's also brought to my attention. Uh, again, I, I, I know these, well, I guess if we're paying $31 an hour, they're no longer volunteers are getting paid for it. Uh, I just think that maybe we should be looking at the plan. I do understand that we need to compensate uh, our volunteer firefighters. I mean, I have no problem with that at all. I think it might be getting a bit rich, that's all. I mean, I know, I know they're, they're very serious, but I go back to why they became volunteer firefighters, and the money didn't seem to be the biggest part of it. So, I mean, we have a lot of volunteers in our community uh, in, in many aspects. So I just kind of want to look at that whole program and see... Uh, if we're getting our, our best bang for a buck. Not to take away from the volunteer firefighters, uh, if that's what they are now, they're getting paid, so I'm still having a bit of trouble with that. But I, it, it, it's a lot. It's a lot of money, and I'm not so sure uh, the community can afford it. But that's all I want to talk about at this time. Okay. Your Worship, uh, Councillor Beddoes, I did quite a bit of research on this prior to the implementation had lots of experience in you know my past 15 years being a paid on call firefighter and a training officer a deputy and chief and a career regional chief and I went through a significant implementation back in 2012 and 2013 with uh, 320 firefighters uh, adopting a, a standard across the region and uh, 
I think it, you know, it does have the perception of being rich, and I think the mayor did an excellent job explaining the actual value of it and what we're trying to achieve, and hence the, the need for a master plan review at some point to really look at the results after we get through these three years of implementation. Uh, there's quite a bit of uh, difference when we look at different type of volunteer agencies in the community. I think one of the biggest differences I find uh, with a paid on call member, they're still volunteering tons of time and service to the community. And the, the biggest ask they have is they don't know when they're serving the community. Uh, they're carrying around something on the side of their hip 24 seven, and that could drop at two in the morning. They meet their miss dinners, they miss meetings, they miss hockey games, you name it. There. So that's one of the biggest differences as opposed to, you know, volunteering down at the food bank or something like that. It's not scheduled and it's not planned and, the, and there's a quick, significant workload to them and the expectations I see on them now with respect to standards in the province and what needs to be done with record keeping and record management, there's a lot that's going on and I really see this as a good plan right now that's uh, showing success on, on the recruitment side. Um, but I do have concerns with the retention side that uh, yeah. you'll be hearing from me in the next year on some strategies with that. Thank you, Chief. So back to the speaking order, Councillor Bateman. Well, I don't have anything profound to say other than the fact that um, what you were saying, Mayor, is, is absolutely appropriate because um, it, it's been a really useful process, I feel, this, this process. Uh, your metal is being tested, and that's good by councillors and elected representatives. Um, it, it, it has been very useful to get these new reports as a reminder and a refresher of this program, volunteer um, on call. Uh, at the end of phase three, I think it's 144,000 approximately annually going ahead, and that is equivalent to one full-time professional firefighter, and you're gonna get 40 plus um, volunteers for that fee. So as a, as a hybrid, um, yeah, it, it's, it's been a good process and I, I uh, appreciate it. Okay. Councillor Lajeunesse on paid on call. Councillor Loggins. Um, just a couple of questions to clarify um, the new business that was presented. Um, and perhaps this is best for the chief if I can ask through you, but uh, Councillor Bettis was asking about the 2019 total for um, in the budget that was provided, provided for the paid on call implementation calculations. And that was 66-ish thousand. Um, and was that, un you said that was under budget? That's correct. Uh, 2019 through your chair was um, an actual being a transition year where things changed July 1st. So the first half was really a calculation of the legacy system. And then Deputy Barney did his uh, best to estimate the, the remaining six months to be really half of that 66 figure. So what was in the budget was about that 53K uh, mark and we ended up uh, only um, as far as uh, actual being close to 40,000. So I think mm -hmm. uh, at the end of it, we we're about 12,000 under budget there. And the main reasons there indicated in that report have to do likely with uh, retention, uh, you know, losing some uh, members, uh, moving out of Souk and taking on work elsewhere. Uh, we did have quite a bit of statistics there showing that we're having a lot of calls during the day that career staff are handling, and then just, uh, you know, different call volume types. They're some, somewhat unpredictable, but uh, those are the main reasons. Okay, so does this, um, I'm just trying to visualize this in my head, because the budget that was set by council was 50 something. So is that 2019 that you have here a different fiscal year? I probably need a little bit of clarification there through your chair on that. Uh, that what you saw there is um, for the 2020 budget is the 99K, which is the implementation of adding that additional Thursday practice. Um, no, not for 2020, sorry for, for the confusion. It, I'm looking at 2019 actuals, and I know they're not actual actuals, but it, it looks like the budget we'd set in 2019 was 59,000 approximately. Yes. And then did that come back to council to be forecast differently? No, it's what actually came up. I'll let the deputy take the chair here. Thank you. 
Council uh, <clears throat> logins through the chair. Yeah, for the what the what we put in the report there was the actuals of the forty thousand and forty, just over forty thousand dollars of what there was. What we actually ended up paying out throughout that system in the spreadsheet that I've been tracking throughout this whole process. Oh, the forty four. The forty four. Okay, so what the total actually paid out, even though we had a budget of the fifty three, whatever there. Oh, it just okay. that's what we estimated that it possibly could be as. And as the chief through retention, we uh, and also with the training stipend that the that the former volunteers got before we went in the paid on call system, um, with the reduction in the numbers that we had and some medical and leave of absences, they didn't meet their minimum training requirements, so they didn't get their training stipend for the year, which also right. So then the sixty six is um, the combination of the training in addition to the calls, and then the budget was set for 53 for the calls alone. Or for the, well, for, yeah, what we expect, yeah, for the calls alone. Gotcha. And, did, and the training stipend that they used to have in the legacy. So was the training a different, the training was a different line item in the 2019 budget? No, it would have been the same budget. The same budget. So then the budget, that's where I'm confused. How are we under budget at 66 when the budget was 53 or when well it was originally projected in the thing that it would approximately be 66 because of the numbers that we were um over the years we did a, a study of how it possibly could be so the 66,000 was a net uh budget estimate that we that i did up to for to forecast for the following years so and then going through that initially when we did the when we did the implementation and then when we came back, we adjusted it to the 53 because it was a more reasonable number at that time. And then now we actually only spent the 40, the 44. Well, 66. Because like what the budget I'm looking at is the District of Souk budget that we approve as council. Mm -hmm. And the total we approved for, it, for volunteer performance incentive, assuming that includes both the training and calls, was supposed to be 53. So I'm just confused as to how 66 is under budget. So do you need that answer today or maybe Ms. Gray? It might be, I'm just, yeah, I don't, I, I think things aren't matching up <laughs> and, it's, and it's starting to confuse me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was just a, yeah, that 66 was a projection of what it possibly could be if everything was at the max. Right. And not, not everything was at the max number for that 66. So, and that's why I say in the spreadsheet that I have at the moment, you know, yeah, we were, the possibility was it could be a max of 66 budgeted if we had all the calls that we got, you know, we had, you know, we had a reduced number of calls this year as well. And then also, that included the training stipend. Like each member used to receive five hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. So then, training. the twenty nineteen budget that we have from you is an estimate, and it's not actually what happened. Yeah, it's not actually what. Happened. Okay, <laughs> sorry for that. I was like, yeah. okay, <laughs> mostly it's because it's almost ten o'clock, and I'm yeah. looking at these numbers, and they're not matching, and yeah, I'm no, going, yeah, "What we, the heck is going yeah. on?" It would okay, be, thank yeah, sixty six was the projection. And then what we've actually spent was the 40, just over the 44. Okay. Okay. And okay. then I just wanted to clarify, minimum wage is 1385. 1585. Minimum wage in BC is 1385. Oh yeah, but with under the but okay. 1585. But, yeah, okay. That's what we got. Okay, Councillor Saint Pierre. Uh, just like to uh, state my appreciation for a program that hopefully keeps a lot of volunteers in Souk and trains them so they can actually do the work that we need. And I would actually like to move this. That okay. uh, council receive the data provided on the fire department's paid on call program for information. Moved by Councillor St. Pierre, seconded by Councillor Bateman. So one final piece that I'll add is I am involved on a select committee on local government finance um, through the UBCM. The report Strong Fiscal Futures was adopted by the membership in 2014 and now that whole report is being updated for current standards. So part of the discussion that we had recently is about these sorts of things and how do we get here. Uh, in part, um, we could blame the province and 
a certain amount of downloading has occurred from other areas. Our volunteers or our department are out dealing with the opioid crisis without any support, and we are providing that support. PTSD within the, attack, the, the departments as well, and the impact of that on their families, binding immigration, binding arbitration, healthcare, training equipment, all the stuff that they keep upgrading and updoing all the time. Uh, and makes the standards now we, we adopt because that is the way they ha it has to be. They changed their laws, we have to change our laws, and that's how it is. And all of these things, these challenges, makes it harder for recruitment even because of things like the opioid crisis. All of our volunteers or crew uh, are carrying Narcan and are trained in that. This is something new that the government on other levels is not addressed fully that we are addressing at a local level. So it's something small, but it's impacting us here in our community and uh, our crew are out there dealing with that all the time. So sometimes we'll say, well, they're not attending to fires, but they're dealing with medical calls because we don't have adequate ambulances here. So sometimes there's been sentiment in the past, like why are you responding to these? Well, because somebody needs to, because we don't have an ambulance in our community at the moment, and I'm not willing to just let that person wait for nothing. So these are the ongoing pieces, and it's just I had taken some notes about it, which is why, why I got kind of fired up about I want to talk about this. Uh, it's something that um, may not move anywhere, but in the case of um, this committee, it's like we're not accepting any more downloads, and whatever we can, we need to upload it back to the rev relevant form of government. Uh, I don't know that it's going to go anywhere, but it may not, but that's why we're looking for alternative ways uh, so that we have more funds coming in uh, to help with the pressures that we face. Because a growing community, does growth pay the way? No, it just costs all of us more. And we attract more affordable housing, it's a cost to the community because we have waived this, this, and this. It's just a cost. And then there's more expectations and more service. So this isn't about just fire, and I'm totally meandering off the motion, but I just wanted to make that point. So on that note, I'm calling the question. All those in favor, opposed, that's carried unanimously. Thank you very much for all the information. And actually, since this is all on here, if there's some way like under fire department on the website where these reports can be there, just so a place where it lives, where it doesn't get lost in our materials so that if um, counselors do want to reference it or have questions from members of the community, it's, it's just a little bit easier to access. It's just the confines of technology sometimes would be great. Okay, so on that, um, is, was that the end of those slides, I believe, right? Okay, so that, we've made it through that report. So then there's the bu budget questions, uh, and there's been further questions here that staff have answered for us with some information. So a question that I wanna ask is about new park staff. When we had the conversation about service level review, uh, and looking at each department and where the service sits, our conversation there was, should we be increasing park service, just given the calls for service or given that we want more green space, so more green space um, has more cost associated with it. And then of course, um, because we as a council increase that service level, then the response from staff is we need to staff it with X. So the question to you now is, do we increase the service level or do we put it back to what status quo was for this year? And then re-examine. Um, if we're looking to trim something, uh, that would be it because that is a result of us increasing a service. So we can leave it at the increased level and fund it, or we set it back to status quo, leave it at that level. Uh, an advantage of doing that is having more conversations in terms of what the service, this whole service review and service level is new to our community. This past year under Norm McInnes's, we've established that, and then here are the levels. Do we want it to remain the same? Do we increase, decrease, or the like? So we're just getting into those conversations. This is one we increased. So Councillor St. Pierre, then Logans. I'm just gonna put out a question to the rest of council, and that's whether or not we consider this to be an investment that'll actually benefit uh, the community in terms of, obviously it'll, it'll benefit uh, amenities and local residents, but will it also bring in dollars through tourism? Uh, is this an investment? 
because I think what we need to be considering here are investments and whether or not this is actually an investment in, in, in Souk. Uh, I suspect it is, but I'd like to open that question up to Council to consider. Okay, that's something to consider. Councillor Logans? Um, first question, are we allowed to talk about things that aren't in these specific reports and specific to the budget? Because I don't really see a spot for that on this agenda. Well, and that'll be the further <laughs> direction that we're going to give to staff. So this is in the report here. Like these were things that came up that we want to look at. Well, um, I see some things missing though. Yeah, so let's, um, okay, so, so we can I, look. Is this the time that this we would is discuss the time. those things? Yeah. Okay, and um, my other. Because we do want to lock in this budget. Yeah. yeah. So we need to sort of, I think have, we've had a number of different things and I think tonight is sort of the case of okay like what else is there and then we tell that to our director she's going to rejig everything and say okay yeah so um, like in the interest of time I would it's this is a lot to go through to discuss each and every one so if it's up if council wants I mean picking out the ones that are meaningful to you and perhaps bringing yes. those forward and not, and not le talking about the others, but, um, and just leaving as is. But then the other thing um, that I'm wondering, first, the service level thing, uh, I know it's new and I'm usually pretty good with change, but I don't know if we're in a financially viable place to do, to just say, yes, we want this service. And without really understanding the financial impacts, go into this budget process because it's created a lot of challenges um, in reducing the tax increase on the budget when we're solely thinking about the benefits that we'll receive. And I understand, like I, I am the kind of person that's like, yes, let's, get, let's pay these taxes and get all these wonderful things, but we can't do it all at once. And it's just been too much, I think, this year. Um, but anyway, I digress. One thing that I am wondering, and perhaps this is, um, through you to our acting CAO, but um, the reserves that we have, like, it's pretty scary when you look at some of them, <laughs> um, in particular, like the capital asset, asset replacement. And we've known this is happening, yeah. like we've known it will happen for a while, but um, I was talking to a counselor in Sandwich the other day, I just bumped into them, and um, they said that they have a specific like they were in a similar situation as us where they had 0% tax increases for many years and then the reserves just plummeted. And so to mitigate that, they've been implementing a 0.5% dedicated annual um, tax increase to reserve funding. Is that something we're doing or is it something we can do? Through you. Uh, <laughs> through your worship, uh, yeah, the CAO and I were actually just talking about that before he went off on vacation. And um, that would be the plan for um, the 2021 budget is to do some more research, um, provide a report to council on our current status of our reserves, some recommendations on potentially combining some of the reserves, mm -hmm. minimum uh, contribution levels or minimum uh, ending balances that we would like and just kind of get some direction from council on where you would like that and then basically build the 2021 budget around that direction because right now it's a little bit of this, a little bit of that and as you can see we just kind of use everything we transfer in there. So it, it's kind of taking 2020 to provide a bit more of a cohesive um, me, like uh, report to council just about specifically about reserves and what the ideal level is and getting um, some of these uh, reports like the building condition assessment and other things that are forthcoming will kind of give us some numbers and guidance on what we need to contribute ideally over the next few years. And so kind of factor those in for 2021 just because all that information won't be available to adopt this budget. So that's kind of was our thought process. Thank you. That's no. really relieving to hear because when I look at the capital asset, at, at asset replacement, it's down to $300 next year. Like, yeah. exactly. That makes me want to poop my pants. Okay. Well, let's not let that happen. So, <laughs> Councillor Bateman. <laughs> Councillor Bateman, did you have your hand up? Or no? Well, I'm, I'm not quite clear what. I would agree with, with Councillor Logan. No, I'm, I'm not. Uh, sorry, then I, I, thought I, I, I thought I saw your hand. So um, I just want to f reframe us so we can get into this. Yeah. And it was about uh, what I heard from Councillor Logan's is this isn't the year to increase a service. It's hard to say that now, though, yeah. because it's all in the budget. 
right? Because we've already said that these are the services we want without knowing the impact that that would yeah. have. And I don't think those things should be separate. I need those. I think those discussions need to happen together, especially for us who aren't in the depths of it every day to really understand what that impact is on the community. So what I see here, though, is by because we if we increase the park service, we need to add two additional part time staff. Mm -hmm. If we leave it at the status quo, then we would not need those two additional staff. Is that correct? That's great. Uh, correct through your worship. Uh, that's this conversation came up at the service level review meeting yep. back in November 5th, I believe it was. Um, and it was directed by council to potentially increase um, parks services mowing the lawn more often etc um, so this was a proposal from the current um, head of parks was to add a, an additional sixty thousand dollars to the budget to hire um, more part-time staff um, for the specific months where it's busier uh, at councillor mcmath at the last meeting was questioning whether we should just hire another parks worker um, so we provided a bit more information just to say that's not what we're looking for is one full-time staff if anything we would benefit from you know a pool of money to pull from auxiliaries for the summer months when it's busier with more parks demands than it would be like right now kind of thing so yeah um, that if hiring full-time staff wasn't isn't recommended and supported by staff um, so it's just a matter of uh, a figure of sixty thousand dollars was put forward and is included in the budget in the six point five eight um, current number so I just looking for direction on do we want to leave it at that Do we want to make it thirty thousand do we want to not do anything and, and defer this till 2021 and look at it again um, consult with the community more this year because that's also our plan is to get out to the community sooner um, in the year and talk about service levels and what do they need and bring some more information forward to council like in the fall early fall yeah um, with that okay. so it's just kind of it's, it's 60,000 is what currently in the budget so it's just do we want to keep it at that number or would we like to reduce it at this point or um, again take just it go back to status quo okay councillor Beddows yeah th thank you for that explanation and um, I guess I go back to Councillor Logan saying that, uh, you know, it's, it's something that, I mean, we all want all these things, but somewhere along the line, we're going to have to cut back somewhere. I mean, we can't go to the public for 6.5% or whatever it is that we're going. So to me, um, we can defer this for another year. Uh, so I'm happy with just taking the whole amount off. And it's too bad that we don't have somebody from Parks to explain in a little bit detail what the impact of not having those two will be but at this stage of the game, we have to find some savings somewhere, and this is unfortunately one of the ones that may fall. So my recommendation. However, it wasn't staff that came to us and said that they needed these additional. We said we should increase the service and, and do more, and then this is the result. And then I back off that. I don't remember saying that, but it's okay. <laughs> yeah, that was in when we had the service level meeting and we well, looked at considering we're trying it. to pare this budget down, yeah, my so that's feeling why is we, we don't go there. Yeah. It's, it's stat let's just status quo, direct people to the service, like this calls for service, get more data, good, good stats, good community consultation, and we can look at it. Councillor St. Pierre? Um, as it happened, I had a conversation with an unnamed uh, park staff at uh, one of our local coffee shops, and what I found out was they could really use auxiliary people. Uh, that, in fact, I don't know about the part-time or the full-time, but really what they have is a surge of work at certain points in time, and they need to be able to expand their auxiliary pool. And I'm curious as to whether or not we could just reduce that 60 by, you know, 40 or 30 or whatever it is, and actually offer them the option of actually increasing their pool and that might actually meet a lot of needs. So that is an option, is you could remove it or you can reduce it, or you can keep it. So, yes, we need a motion. So, Councillor Logans. Um, and I'll move that Council direct the Director of Finance to remove the two additional part-time staff parks members uh, for the 2020-2024 financial plan. However, um, I would also you, encourage... You need to get a seconder before you start motivating. So uh, is there a seconder? Not encourage counsel. Mm. I, and maybe that's where I need direction on this motion, is that if staff require an auxiliary to come back with an amount for an auxiliary staff that we could put in? Mm -hmm. So it's... There's still contingency, so if we're finding ah. that there's just crazy weather patterns and there's constant debris and they're falling behind, they need to be able to come to us and say, we really need an extra person. Okay, I'm happy with that. I'm just then. raising yeah. this because 
or it's the case we then find it in the budget somewhere. Then we have to choose, we need to add this, and then this isn't going to happen. Okay, and we're I'm gonna happy go. with this motion. Thank we you. always need to do that. I'm just looking at this. We increase the service, and this is a result of that. So, yeah, I mean, we've added more people to the auxiliary. We've added more equipment for that reason. But I think this year I agree with Councillor Beddoes. Like, we need to just tighten up. So you need a seconder before discussion on Yes, the second it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so discussion on the motion. I'm getting tired, that's yeah. all. I'm getting cranky. Okay, anything? Oh, I'll, just, I'll just note that when we look at the five-year plan, we have a 25% increases over these next five years. So I agree completely with all of us here that we need to keep these costs under under control. And also, we are a five-bloom community already. So something's going right out there in our, our parkland. It is. But I, I agree that we need to it's also... not just flowers. Yeah, exactly. Call a question. All those in favor, opposed, it's carried unanimously. Uh, so the next part was about including or removing committee support. My recommendation is that as we form committees, we find if we require additional support, we fund it from contingency. Council needs to make that call. Councillor St. Pierre, then Logan's. Uh, I have no objections to that. However, <clears throat> I do have uh, a concern with the fact that we've actually cut contingency and now we're adding potential auxiliaries, we're adding committee support. We still don't have a line item for anything relating to any climate related projects that might be happening with community groups or any such, which means that that would also come to contingency. So we've reduced, reduced our contingency and we've actually added a whole bunch of stuff that could potentially come out of a contingency. Maybe, or it would come from a different project. As the year goes on and let's say we, staff are finding they're not gonna be able to get to this or do this, then we start to look at the budget. I just put contingency because it's one to start of, but in terms of uh, you know, climate action deliverables, we need that from the committee that we formed that we funded with a facilitator and that is fully staffed. So that should come from the committee rather than, and that's what I would expect of any of the others as well. Okay. Um, what I'm hearing is that at some point in time, there may be extra money in the budget that could perhaps pay for things that at this point we expect to come out of, out of a contingency fund. No, there's no extra money. What I'm saying is, let's say we want to fund an auxiliary staff, park staff for $60,000 and that comes forward, then we will ask our CAO, in here you have these other staffing positions and other people that are not hired. Can you put those off now? Like we're hiring right now for a deputy finance director. If we find that we need a park staff member because that's more critical, then maybe one is going to have to take priority out of the other. I'm not saying everything has to come from contingency, but if things happen that changes how the district is going to operate, there's going to need to be give and take from all departments. Okay. Uh, at this point, my concern is also very specifically with, you know, not, 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 not the Climate Action Committee per se, because it's already had uh, some help along, but really how are we actually going to pay for our further committee structure, uh, how are we going to pay for a lot of different things, but most especially, and I guess this does relate to climate, we don't have any way to assist. Uh, we have a huge number of volunteer groups. We have all kinds of people in the, in the community, Fuchi, Lions, all sorts of people. They could all be involved in doing really good projects that would actually, you know, help us out in terms of meeting our strategic objectives and actually leverage the money that we have, and we don't have a lot of it, with a huge core of volunteers. And I would really like to make sure that we have money somewhere for that. Now, I've heard some talk of potentially um, maybe rolling surpluses into, you know, some sort of a reserve that could be used for that, that purpose. But I do think that we need to consider how can we actually support our volunteers and our community members in getting past our own human resource bottlenecks. And right now there's nothing that I can see in the budget for that, except for our community grants, which have also been cut. So we have our community grants that have been cut, our contingency has been cut. How do we support the community so we can actually get the work we've done for cheap, is what I'm saying. But uh, can the district, can sue taxpayers fund every community group out there with their admin needs? 
I, I don't, I don't understand, I'm sorry, I, I, don't answer, I don't understand the question. What I'm asking is our internal committees, and as we form them, much like we said to the chamber, and they decide what they're going to do, I think this is the year where we figure all that out, and then what staffing resources are needed, and if they need something, we can fund it from contingency. Just forming a bunch of committees so that we have them, and then bringing in staff to staff them because we need them, but what is the purpose of these committees? Doesn't make sense to me. So in this case, as we determine this is the type of committee that we have, this is the type of resources that we need, we can figure that out. Um, but I think in the meantime, if they need a consultant, fine, or if they need this, fine, we can fund that from contingencies when we actually strike said committee. I don't see the point on putting in a committee support person and funding when we don't even know what the committee's going to be. It's like a weird egg. Okay, I'm going to Councillor Logan, so I'm recognizing her point of order and focusing on that. <laughs> um, that was the question, that, that was my response to yeah, Councillor Logan. Yeah, and understanding that this, this PDF, which is extremely helpful, thank you staff, ha, ha, brings up a lot of questions and a lot of discussion, and that it's quarter after 10, and that we have members who I believe are potentially from the House Horseshoe Pitching Association who probably okay. don't want to hear us bantering on about the budget for another hour before they are able to present. I would like to postpone this to the next regular council meeting or schedule one, as I repeatedly suggested, to have several um, budget meetings so that we can address these things properly. Uh, Postpone it to another meeting where we can have some more discussion on these items and not put our residents out anymore tonight. So there's a motion on the floor to postpone to a next meeting. So that's been, so from this point onwards, um, then that'll be postponed. And that's been seconded by Councillor Lajeunesse. Any discussion on that? Councillor Beddoes? Yeah, I, uh, I would like, first of all, I agree that people from the horseshoe pitching, uh, let's hear them out and then see what time we've got remaining uh, till 11 o'clock, because I think we're all committed to 11 o'clock. Uh, once they're dealt with and they're free to go, uh, then we can get back to doing some of these, and when we run out of time, that's when we defer them to another time. Yeah, so I would say let's postpone this till after, like I'm... I would postpone That would be tabling. To, I'll amend my own motion to table it to after the horseshoe pitching discussion. Okay. 10.4, item 10.4. Okay, so motion to table to after item 10.4. That's been seconded by... <laughs> okay, the first one's withdrawn. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried unanimously. So we'll move to... Yes? Uh, I was wondering why are we just doing uh, till after the horseshoe as opposed to going further down the end of the agenda? I would prefer to, you know. Sure. <laughs> why not move it till the end of the agenda items? I don't know. The budget Council is complex. It and might serve us well to have another day to do it as Councillor Logans has suggested. I think that's what was being suggested, not necessarily to go just past the horseshoe pitch. Uh, I think that what we should do is complete the rest of the agenda and then see if we have time. Yeah, actually, Councillor Logans, why don't we, are you comfortable? Rescinding the motion? Yeah, so move yes. it to follow 13.2, or pardon, 13.1, there's no 13.2. So I'm okay with that as a second. Yeah. yeah, then we get through our business that's in front of us, Good. and then we can Great. return yes. and see, Understood. okay? Okay. All right, all, all right. those in favor of that, <laughs> opposed, is carried unanimously. So we're moving to the horseshoes. Sorry, I thought you were all here for the budget. I was so excited that you're here. So thank you for staying with us. Okay. So we have a report here on the horseshoe pitch, and uh, this provides a bit more clarity here. So, but I I don't quite get it. So they're they're in like a they had a. They had a term and then that's expired and now they're in the new term? That takes them to the end of 2023? Um, the term expires February, the end of February. Of this year? Of this year. It's a three, it was a three year contract, so it expires February, end of February 2020. So we're just seeking to renew the agreement for another three years. 
Um, there's limitations on making it five years because then it becomes a subdivision and it's way more messy. Um, so the recommendation is to renew for another three-year term um, at this time. Okay, so then if we wanted to go beyond that, then we have another process that we have to kick off. Like if we just wanted to make it 10 years after the three years? Yes, because then it turns into this whole other different, you're subdividing the property basically and it, legally. I don't know all the specifics. I could find out the information, but it's a lot more complicated if we're going to go longer than a three-year term. So legally, it, you enter a different realm if it's over three years, which is why this has just been a three-year rolling uh, term. You're basically disposing of the land um, in that case if it's over I see. the three years. Okay. Um, and then one of the additions to... Um, the current is uh, the horseshoe pitch wanted to address clause 14. So currently it says to, uh, 90 days notice if forever, whatever reason the district needed to ask them to vacate the land before the end of the term. So um, the horseshoe pitch was seeking um, council support to include a clause saying that council, should that occur, council would find, uh, work with them to find a suitable location for them to be in. And um, just as included in the report, it just, Legally, we staff have been advised that's not um, it's not being recommended to include that term in there just because if a suitable like what's the definition of a suitable location if one can't be found, it could just um, it could be problem, problem problematic. So, um, just as alternative suggestion was either we can extend it from 90 days to potentially 180 days, um, or again if council chooses to add the clause in that can be done but there's just specific notices that need to get posted um, for this so that's just kind of what this is about is to get author direction to post the notices and if potentially you would like to change clause 14 uh, we can deal with that okay. councillor Beddoes yeah so there's no problem renewing it every three years correct okay so we can just go on and on forever so uh, and, the, and the second part about the clause uh, I agree with staff I don't think that's something we should have in it's too sort of vague uh, I think there has to be a leap in faith uh, by the, the Horseshoe uh, Association uh, that we are looking after their interests. I mean, I, I don't think we can commit to finding another spot for them. Uh, and in all likelihood, they're probably not going to need it because I think we're, we're okay with the three-year okay. lease. So I think we just leave that out. But the three years, I don't have any problem. Renew it and let them get on with do what they do there. A lot of fun when I played horseshoes there that day. Okay, so are you going to make the motion then that council directs staff to publish a notice of proposed property sure. disposition in accordance with section 26 of the community charter and that council directs staff to, after the second notice has been published, execute the use, management, and maintenance agreement between the District of Souk and the Horseshoe, Souk Horseshoe Pitching Association dated February 5th, 2020. Moved by Councillor Beddoes, seconded by Councillor Logans. No, I think it's great. I'm glad that it's growing and it's, it's drawing more people and I think that's fantastic. That's excellent. Mm -hmm. Councillor Logans? Um, last term there was so much back and forth about would this be a good thing, would it be a bad thing and what's going to happen but it looks like it's a good thing yeah. and uh, we don't want to move it. We want to keep it where it is so I'm glad we're renewing for another term. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much for your perseverance there. Okay, so I'll call the question. All those in favour? Opposed? It's carried unanimously. The only question I get asked is where's the horse, but I'll leave that with you. And thanks for hanging in there. Yes, <laughs> but feel free to stay with us till the end. I thought you were here for the budget. Feel free to come play with us anytime. Yes. Right. We did that one time, it was a lot of fun. We will be having another community challenge. We'll be approaching you. Let we look go. forward to the challenge. Okay, so 10.5, Canadian Institute of Planners. We have a report here, Councillor St. Pierre. I think as was noted by a lot of people, uh, this may not be the best time to get an award for you know, planning on daycares, but I was wondering whether or not City Spaces could actually apply for the award themselves with our support. Um, through your I'm not 100% sure. Uh, I just, I think it, the award looks better if you have support like this is the project being submitted so I, I would presume that they would want support from council that you actually were um, liked the report that they presented this is more about the report not necessarily how we're implementing these actions so um, I don't know that they would submit this project if, if council didn't support um, this I, I I don't believe so but I can I could confirm I guess what I'm asking here is is this about Souk 
applying for an award or city spaces applying for an award? City spaces. Mm, okay, well that's different. No, it's still all the same. No? So I um, just think that council should receive this for yeah. information. So I'll move that. Okay. I'll move. The council receive this for, for information. So Councillor Bateman is moving that um, the report be received for information. That's seconded by Councillor Lajeunesse. Anything further? All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried unanimously. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, number 771, like the information package here. So this has gone out. Um, the, the text amendments here. So at this point, there is... Oh. Um, do we call for public input on this stage or no? No, we've done that. Okay. So questions from members of council for our staff on the report, on the text amendments in the blue pages? Anything to present? Uh, through your worship, I believe this is just um, a formality. It's just a text amendment, um, otherwise known as a housekeeping item to... Um, okay. I know I'm not supposed to say that, apparently. Sorry. Very good. <laughs> so... The, I'll look then that council give third reading to bylaw number 771, zoning amendment bylaw 600 78 2020. Moved by Councillor Lajeunesse, seconded by Councillor St. Pierre. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried unanimously. And then also then that council adopt bylaw number 771, zoning amendment bylaw 600 78 2020. Moved by Councillor Bateman, seconded by Councillor Lajeunesse. Discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried unanimously. Okay, 11.2 sewer improvement loan authorized in bylaw. This is a this is a big one. Thank you for for being with us tonight. I'll turn it over to staff. Excellent report. Anything to add, Ms. Gray? Um, through your worship. So yes, um, our manager of wastewater. Cam Priest has patiently waited <laughs> to support me in this uh, report. Uh, so this is, as I mentioned in the report, there is a grant opportunity available. Uh, there's a deadline of February 26 to apply for this grant. So a part of condition of the grant is to secure or for council, the district, sorry, to um, commit to finding a way to fund their portion of the grant, which is 26.67% of the cost of the total project. So. Um, Basically, in the interest of time, I can let uh, Mr. Priest talk to more, uh, maybe a little bit more of other options we can have to fund this, but in the interest of time, we have to show that in the worst case scenario, we would be willing to potentially fund the, our $2.2 .2 million portion with a loan if it came to that. Um, but this is just getting it to third reading. We would still have to go through um, the assent process or um, alternative approval process, so there would be different, um, this isn't, committing us to for sure doing this. There's other processes that would still um, be undertaken before a loan for this amount would be um, taken out, but just it's required as a submission for the grant application is to show that the whole portion is being funded. So maybe um, Mr. Priest could maybe just touch on some other options that'll most likely get that number down um, by the time we hear about our grant, which would take a year to hear about. Uh, yeah, through your worship. Um... This is probably a little overwhelming, especially on short notice and in a short window, but the grant application doesn't move forward without the third reading, period. So if we don't get it and we're pushed off, we have to wait till the next intake, which could be up to a year away again. Um, so are there options to help with uh, the District of Souk's funding share would be um, uh, developer buy-in as was done with the original project um, partnerships with First Nations um, don't really know what that would look like at this time um, there's some assumptions here on my part um, that the new years a new SS sewer service area would be established for the um, the new areas that come into the sewer service um, so certainly those folks would be on the hook for some of the funding as well. I wouldn't anticipate that anybody that is um, that has is on the existing sewer system and has paid for th that system would be contributing to anything new outside of the system. Um, and then there could be some latecomers agreements uh, in place that uh, uh, new developments 
outside of the sewer service area would be contributing as they came online. Having said all that, I, I believe that we need to prepare a wastewater master plan. <laughs> uh, it's used, words been used a lot tonight, our feasibility study that looks at the whole system, the, the system as a whole, and where, we're, where our bottlenecks are, um, what happens to the system when we add this area or that area to it, where the bottlenecks are, what improvements need to be done. Um, that that is all part of this process. Um, this particular bylaw and borrowing and grant uh, monies would pay for expansion of the treatment plant uh, by 50 percent. So one, another basin onto the existing two basins, and it would also include a new uh, <coughs> uh, sewer force main from the West Coast Road, West Coast Road pump lift station to. Um, virtually to the treatment plant. Um, the, the, the reasons why this is necessary is because we're, we've hit beyond the 70% capacity, dry weather capacity at the wastewater treatment plant. Um, and that includes uh, committed buy-ins that still aren't on the system, but need to be considered when the, when the, um, uh, the assessments are being done. Um, it, it includes, it's supposed to include what's in the sewer service area, but I think over time this, uh, the uh, potential build out within the sewer service area has increased through densification. And um, that's another reason I think that a feasibility study, study or, or uh, uh, wastewater master plan needs to be um, done hand in hand with this so we get a real handle on what the remaining capacity would be even if we expanded the treatment plant. Um, but this is the first step. We need to get this passed so that we can put a legitimate grant application in. If the grant application fails, um, We'll, they'll give us the reasons why it failed, we'll sharpen our pencil and we'll go back after the next intake. That's always helpful, I'd like to know why you didn't receive a grant so that, you know, what pieces, was it the wrong program, whatever. So, yeah. well, we will remain hopeful, it'll be important to get that feedback so we know what to do. No, it, it's, it's a, Yes, thank you very much for the report. And I think this just outlines that we're at the start of this. We have a timing issue. We need to do this. And then there's a whole sequence of events that are going to fall into place accordingly. The grant, though, like, it could be a year before we find out if we're... Yeah, anywhere from yet. late next fall to this time next year. Is it a federal grant, then? It's a combined provincial federal grant. Okay. Green Environment Grant. Okay. No, I'm just aware that we're still waiting for the outcome on one grant that all went dark because of the federal election, so that's why I asked, because I'm like, what's happening? Because that tends to mess up announcements and when we hear on things, so, but, okay. Councillor St. Pierre? I suspect this, we're all gonna be pretty much on the same page. Uh, we're at capacity, we need to do something about it. We're not committing to anything except moving this thing along. Uh, we really need the sewers over there so we can actually deal with contamination of the basin, so we can provide sewers to our industrial lands and start balancing our tax portfolio down Caltasson. I mean, we just need this stuff. So uh, I'd like to vote. Oh. Councillor Beddoes? No, I just I need a clarification. This uh, uh, third basin, uh, we're going to increase things by a third. Will that allow us to go across the bid to Caltasson, or will that would just do the uh, whip and spit area? What is that third basin? Well, the, uh, through your worship, the, uh, all indications are we have um, all the ingredients for a um, positive application because of both IR1 and IR2 and getting across the bridge and into Wiffensput and getting into those uh, septic systems on the Souk Basin that are causing issues. Um, so this, this grant would be pushing 
both IR1 and IR2 into participation. Okay, so it would have the capacity to, to, yes. to handle those there. Okay, that's all I wasn't quite clear on. Uh, would that be enough to push across the bridge to the First Nations on uh, and Keltasin? And your answer is yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay, are there any other questions? And then I want to go through these recommendations. One, like I want to break them out because we need to do them separately. So just um, Councillor Bateman on... On the whole, before we yeah, do that. Yeah, just a um, couple of questions. One related to, um, so this this um, basin that will be built, the uh, extra 50% capacity, it, is that the end of the opportunities for further uh, expansion? No, there's room there's room for a fourth basin. A fourth basin, so okay. So the, the current capacity can be doubled. All right, all right. And... Um, yeah, I, I could go on at length about this, but um, I, my one curiosity was a year ago we were having, during the heavy uh, rain events, some overflows uh, at the plant. How, how have you managed over the last few weeks? Um, so we haven't had any non-compliance overflows, but in the wet weather, um, in the significant rain events, we do have issues with um, with how we how we we manage the uh, inflow um, i've we've recently had our SCADA integrator do some wet weather programming for us that has um, removed the need for a physical body at the plant like overnight in a wet weather situation uh, and it's automated now so yeah. those are some improvements it's still we're still nearing capacity in wet weather but We've managed to avoid some of the uh, heavy manual labor required. Okay. Thank you. Okay, good. Yep. Other questions? Councillor St. Pierre? Just a quick one about the uh, first point. Uh, Council give first, second, and third. I, I sort of understood that we wouldn't be doing third, or is there just some point of order? Like, I'm not sure how this works. Um, um, through your worship. Um, um, the grant requirement actually has to have three readings for it to be accepted. Um, so rather than some some places go through right through to adoption, but the three readings will suffice. So that's what we're proposing. Okay. Can Can I move this? Yeah. Well, I'm gonna. I'll read it out okay. and then I'll turn to you. Okay. So council give first, second, and third reading to sewer loan authorization bylaw number seven seven six twenty twenty. Moved by. Councillor Bateman, <laughs> seconded by Councillor Lajeunesse. Discussion? All those in favor, opposed, that's carried unanimously. Um, that's subject to obtaining statutory approval from the Inspector of Municipalities for Sewer Loan Authorization Bylaw number 776, 2020. Council approve an alternative approval process for the purpose of seeking approval of the electors. Moved by Councillor St. Pierre, seconded by Councillor Bateman. All those in favor, opposed, is carried unanimously. Uh, thirdly, that staff submit an application for grant funding application for grant funding application for sewer improvement project through ICIP, Green Infrastructure Environmental Quality Substream, and that council support the project and commit to its share up to $2.2 million for the project. Moved by Councillor Lajeunesse, seconded by Councillor St. Pierre. Questions? All those in favor, oppose, is carried unanimously. Ms. Rear? Um, through your worship, I just wanted to clarify. Oh, sorry, ask the question first. Did you ask the question already? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, I just wanted to clarify that um, even though it's one, two, three here up on the board, it probably won't happen in that order. Um, we've got our first, second, and third, and we'll probably just go and submit the application. And we can sit on the three readings until we've actually heard back from the grant um, through the grant process before we proceed into the, the AAP process. Okay, so I think we will need to just develop some communication on this because there's going to be a lot of questions from the community on this item, I think, I feel, in terms of... Yeah, like sooner rather than later. So this is an excellent report, uh, and it just sort of illustrates that we're, we're the beginning. But th the questions will be like, 
where like where are you going with this and and so I think we'll just sort of need to um, have updates at the next meeting because I suspect that's what we're gonna we need to be prepared and be ahead of our messaging with right. this so it'll be helpful maybe at the next council meeting that um, it just whatever staff can bring us uh, you know I'm not giving you good direction here but we need we need information uh, as we go down this and even if it's elements of the report that are expanded out this is this is a significant piece of infrastructure to our community and what does it mean but it's an excellent starting point it's fall mm -hmm. it's just absolutely necessary. I mean, that's necessary. yeah and then it raises the questions like can we talk about metering with the system using CRD water metering and and how are things like these are where things will go and then where how do we determine where uh, inclusion is and exclusion is like how do we determine that and and more information on the environmental quality there's been many resolutions passed by many councils over the years even bringing those all together into one place would be extremely helpful even recognizing that the South nation signed off on our outfall with the understanding they would be connected like that goes back to 2006 these are very important documents yeah okay okay into the materials thank you very much for the report and for hanging out with us feel free to stay <laughs> please as, as he runs out the door, <laughs> like, i know i am out of here that. all right um uh, is that our notice of motion then is this here for notice or are we here debating this oh this is for consideration tonight okay so from councillor st pierre he is moving that council direct staff to work on a comprehensive review of our wildlife management strategy with the input and in collaboration with effective community stakeholders, including the South Nation, the RCMP, organizations dealing with wildlife conservation, farmers hunted, hunters hunted, and other interested parties that should inform any amendments to the firearm bylaw and happen prior. Is there a seconder for that motion? I'll second it. Okay, seconded for discussion purposes. Councillor St. Pierre. Uh, I'll keep it brief because it's late. Uh, but what I've noted with the firearms bylaw is that its major flaw is that it's not actually taking into account uh, a wildlife management strategy. And so it's basically a horse before the cart type of thing, uh, or a cart before the horse. We don't know exactly what we want to be able to do with firearms in our local jurisdiction. We also don't, at least I don't feel we have a strong sense of uh, how it's actually being, um, good Lord, I'm losing it. <sighs> Who's actually enforcing? So how's enforcement happening? So uh, it's not our bylaw officers that are actually enforce an issue with firearms, it's the RCMP. My understanding is RCMP are gonna enforce provincial and federal legislation before they enforce our bylaws. And that the actual provincial uh, regulations cover most of what our, our firearms bylaw cover. So I'd like to actually have a really good look at that and see whether or not we need to, what we should be doing with our firearms bylaw with all of that information and not just trying to make it up as we go along. Okay, Councillor Beddoes. Yeah, I, uh, I, I concur with uh, the basic uh, premise here. Uh, when we were dealing with the bow addition to the firearms, uh, it just didn't make any sense. I mean, I'm sorry, the provincial regulations uh, cover off uh, where a firearm is used and uh, the distances and everything, and all we're doing is repeating some of those things in our bylaw and are unnecessary. We will not send our bylaw officer out on a gun call, just no. under no circumstances. So I'm more in favor of repealing this whole thing yeah. and then strike a, I, I strike a committee in s slower time uh, with all those people that Councillor St. Pierre said. Uh, we had a wonderful uh, talk from uh, the Fish and Game people and uh, they made a lot of sense. And uh, uh, this thing needs just some rework by some competent people. And uh, I, I'm all for repealing the firearms by law altogether until we can get a good one. Yeah, well, I, I agree with you because now I don't, I kind of wonder why we even brought it in, like what the intent was back in the day because, and is it even, 
I, I think that goes on yeah, to what I'm saying is if we just like, repeal it and then do it over again, is uh, how many times have we have actually actioned this bylaw? Probably never because it would be the Mounties that come on a gun call. Uh, so, I mean, it's let's get rid of it and, and do something more sensible. Or maybe we don't need to do anything at all. I don't know. But uh, they made a pretty good compelling case about some of the lands up the far end of our uh, <laughs> municipality that they have permission from the owners, and it's acres and acres of wild land. I hope they're not the animals over here. If, you know, if they cull a few deer, well, I guess that's the case. But um, uh, yeah, no, I, th th they made sense to me. So uh, I don't know, do we have to repeal it this time? Or, or I guess, what's, what's the motion? Oh, we got the motion to- uh, We have a motion on the floor right now. So this one we would need to address first and then we would look at, um, and then you could entertain sure. a motion after that. Councillor Bateman. Well, this, this smells awfully like a task force to me, a short term <laughs> task force come together perhaps under Councillor St. Pierre's direction to, to come forward with a little bit of staff support as opposed to staff having to go away and as Tracy Lawrenson said last week, every staff report is worth at least $3,000. So here's a task force, have a time limited, come back to us and um, then we'll repeal the bylaw. Okay, Councillor Logans. Um, that is a good point that uh, Councillor Bateman brings up is when I read this um, motion I'm not sure how big this project is going to be and it could be really big <laughs> um, especially when we're doing community stakeholder um, consultations as well and heading into the OCP review when staff are going to be focused on those community consultations I think that takes a priority um, so I'm, I'm not quite sure where I sit on this. So I'm a bit stuck uh, with this. Um, I see the intent. I like task force. It's a bit more nimble. Um, we're we're cutting the budget, right? Like we're trying to find and here, and then I'm saying over and over, we want to focus on our OCP, our transportation master plan, parks and trail master plan, like very specific things to get done. And then this is a big other piece. And I just don't know that like maybe next year so I'm going to sort of say take that approach that if it's for staff to go and do something then it means we are taking them away from something else and right now I'm not comfortable doing that so I don't I don't support directing our staff and pulling them to do this when we have other pressing documents that have to take priority Councillor Beddoes if we just repeal the firearms bylaw this sort of takes care of itself. I mean, I, I just don't see the urgency on it. We've got, we've got the serious, possible serious violations covered by the BC government, mm -hmm. and uh, they have very strict laws on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I'm all for doing this, but not this year. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have, uh, I have a lot of gun experience, and I would like to be. If we ever do strike a task force, I like to be a very big part of that. I have. All sorts of qualifications in the gun world. So, mm. Councillor Saint Pierre, uh, if we went ahead and repealed the, the firearms bylaw, I think that would actually take care of a whole lot of stuff. Yeah. I do think, however, based on uh, some of the original intent on the amendments, which was to deal with geese and wildlife management, and honestly, it still doesn't address this basic thing where if uh, if you have to shoot uh, an animal, you have to leave it to rot. Uh, whereas I know that it's other jurisdictions have managed arrangements where they can actually work with hunters and farmers to actually harvest the animals. So I think there are pieces where we can actually, we really need a wildlife management strategy. I don't know if we need to get really deep into it necessarily. Uh, I'm totally willing to put it off to another year, especially if yes. we actually repeal the firearm bylaw. Yeah, okay, yeah. And then I think that's, let's go with there and let's collect some, harvest some good ideas this year at um, various events that we may go to. So. I'm going to call the question on this, um, not telling you how to vote, but what I'm hearing is that we defeat this and then we entertain another motion after that, okay? So all those in favor? <laughs> Why are we deferring it? Well, I thought we were defeating this. That's what I said. Can I know, but okay. the, the motion's oh, been moved and seconded, so we need. Oh, okay. So we'll start yeah. over. Yeah. We, so, so what's happening here? We yeah. we are. It's 
It's already moved and seconded. Yeah. What's so moved and seconded? Yeah, this, this has one. been moved and seconded because gotcha. a notice of motion, you're automatically moved it. Councillor Beto seconded it. And I moved it. Give so it now, yeah. exactly. Now that all there's right. discussion, what we want to do is yeah. defeat it. Right. Okay. So, so you now can we say all in favor, I'd, we keep our hands down. <laughs> right? If you're in favor of defeating it, don't put your hands Just up. Just checking. Okay, because it's what? on the floor. All right. So I'll try it again. All, all those right. in favor? Opposed. <laughs> We're all opposed, so it's defeated. <laughs> Well, this and so, is so now useful. it is this because is good. what you're doing now is you're giving us direction for future notices of motion. This is the year of the OCP. These yes, master plans and staff need to we stay. Well, they need good. focus, focus, focus. I use that a lot with my. It's like focus. We need yeah. to get this. We yeah, need focus, to get this focusing. to focus. So the next motion is by Councilor. I make Councilor a motion Red. that we repeal the firearms, whatever number it is. Uh, firearms and bow bylaw. Yeah, yeah, I'll yeah. second that. Okay, and that's been seconded. So, Councillor St. Pierre to repeal the firearms bylaw. And uh, so that will probably come to Council at an upcoming meeting. That's why we didn't just do it? Well, well, procedurally. Procedurally, I would say let's put this on to the next regular agenda with a staff report um, just to make Makes it. Makes sense. The public might want to yeah, know. Yeah, because the public will want to yeah. know. So. I think it'll be the case, so a more appropriate motion would be that council direct staff to bring the firearm bylaw to an upcoming meeting with the intent to repeal it. So moved. Moved by okay. Councillor Bettos, okay. seconded by Councillor St. Pierre. For repeal, possible repeal. Okay, all right, all those in favor? Opposed, that's carried unanimously. Okay, so we got through that, and then that goes back into the budget. So we. Oh, we got correspondence. Oh, correspondence. Oh, sorry. <coughs> so here's where we got some information and what i understand though is that transition souk is going to be doing some things is that correct yes okay so we could potentially forward this to transition souk yes and ann clement is the okay yep so that um council directs staff to forward the correspondence to ann clement at Transition Souk for their information. And then maybe something can tie in, right? Just a point of discussion. Uh, I believe some of our staff are supposed to be working on this. I'm not sure. That was my impression. And are, are, we don't know. Is our staff doing stuff? <laughs> okay. Okay, so there's that's the motion, and that's been moved by Councillor Bateman and seconded by Councillor St. Pierre. Um, of course, you can share it with the Climate Action Committee for their information. You can just do that. So there we go. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried unanimously. Okay. We have time to get into the budget again. So. No, I, six no? minutes. Why don't we? Let's just. Yeah, oh, 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 they're holding the post in. Okay, over to staff, please. Um, just through your worship, yeah, just to kind of confirm, obviously we, well, we can't finish this discussion today. So I just wanted to highlight just a couple quick things before we postpone this to the next um, meeting and determine when that might be. Um, is uh, There was discussion about the grants and that the budget's being reduced this year for the grants and it's not currently reduced in the draft in front of you. I know there was conversations about potentially reducing it, but no decision had been made and actually that was missing from this report that we're supposed to coming back to. There was conversations about potentially reducing the grant budget, but as, as it stands right now, it's um, status quo for what it used to be. Last year was an anomaly. I don't get into that conversation right now, but um, so it's sitting at $90,437, which was the same funding from a couple years ago. So. Um, it was just more about conversation about potentially reducing that for 2020. Um, and then the other piece was just in regards, we had some new information provided about the demand, the large project, the Demand Mule Creek Bridge. 
crossing. Um, there was some new information that has um, significantly increased the cost of this project. So it's causing staff to most likely pause this project for 2020 because no. the, I know, but the grant application is February 20, February 20th. That's the deadline. And it's almost a million dollars over what our current budget is. So we need to re-examine this and see if we can parcel into potentially two phases. Um, we got, we had to get a class, uh, I think it's, I believe it's a class B estimate and, and some of the phases of this or pieces of this came in significantly higher than the, the park staff had anticipated. So um, at this point, we just need to kind of re-examine this and potentially look at if there's other grants available that might offer um, more funding because there's also a cap on the amount of uh, provincial funding that's available in this program too, unfortunately. So just to kind of highlight that it's in there, but most likely it, if it'll have to most likely get moved to 2021 and potentially like phase it over two years for 2021 and 2022, um, unless council can find a whole lot of money to fund our portion. Right. So that was unfortunately just the latest um, news as updated costing came in. Um, so just those two updates on those um, pieces. And then I guess if we're going to defer this for further conversation, I don't know if we, you guys would be ready to discuss this at the community of the whole, kind of do the same thing that we did uh, last uh, on Monday was have a more fulsome discussion at the Committee of the Whole, make some recommendations that then Council could bring forward to the February 24th uh, regular Council meeting and formally endorse any of the recommendations is a so suggestion. That's what I would recommend and then any information you can have on the Little River Crossing that could be presented there as well because I think that's that's because we don't know that right yeah. so it's important to know that. Um, I'm also looking to you as our director of finance, where else can we remove something? So I'm looking for what is nice to have and what do we need to have and just to see what can be thinned down a little bit. Like we're all sort of finding stuff, but now it's, we also need to hear from staff, like really what can you sharpen your pencil on is what I'm asking and to bring that to the to the like and I think the committee of the whole and for all of us council we've been in this for quite some time some of you more so than others uh, at the committee of the whole is hash hash it all out and then so that at February 24th we can just we're not going to re debate these things I think we're hitting a point now where we need to do that and then we just need to we need to committee of the whole week is a committee of the whole so we can't um, everything has to be recommended to council uh, and that's the formality but let's try to get through it all and then formalize it all on uh, the 24th so if you can update us for the committee of the whole okay here's where your number is at I'm thinking like a 4.2 would be great <laughs> um, for, <laughs> just throwing that out there but anyway, Councillor Beddoes, then St. Pierre. Well, at, at the last meeting, we did discuss the, uh, the community grants, and uh, I believe at that time the consensus was that uh, uh, we looked at the past and there was a, a will of councils and previous ones to whittle that back o over time, and that we put a pretty strict criteria where people come in and, and they had three years to prove themselves, and then they were to be cut off, and I believe we're into that third year. So uh, I think in, uh, it's, it's one that is a lot of people in the community really don't like that program at all. And I think it behooves us to cut that back from 90, what, 99? It's 90,437. 90, 90,000 to 65. Okay. So that's um, a motion. Councillor Beddoes is making a motion to cut the community grants to 65,000. Seconded by Councillor Logan's discussion. Councillor St. Pierre, microphone. I think that supporting new programs in the community with our volunteers is something that saves us money. I think this is wasting our money. I think we need to actually spend that money in the right place and invest it in our community groups. But I think um, 65,000 is up from last year's 50,000. That's only because we managed to whittle it away before we even got to the table. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Logans. For four years, I sat at the table arguing that point so that we could get the budget up to where it was. 
<laughs> where it is. And 90,000 is excessive and inappropriate for our community. That's all it comes down to. I'm the first person to say we need to have more people um, doing activities and programs and projects in our community. And I completely agree that money is better spent on those community groups than us trying to accomplish those things. We get way more out of that, way more value, way more return on investment for putting money in community grants. But we cannot afford to have $90,000 there. So I'm, I'm 65,000 is definitely a good number. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Councillor Logans. Yeah. Councillor Bateman? I think we spent 67,000, so it'd be nice to just have parity with last year. 62.03. Oh, what's it? 62. Okay. There you go. Now we got yeah. to get again. 3,000 yeah. increase. Okay, so we have increased the budget. What the number is. Okay. Okay. okay, let's do it. Call a question. All those in favor? Pose is carried unanimously. Okay, so very good, everyone. Um, in the essence of time, motion to adjourn, please. We're no, I've already moved. I, I thought of that and then I, I passed. So, motion to adjourn by Councillor Bateman, seconded by Councillor Logans. All those in favor? Third and fourth. Opposed. <laughs> this is carried unanimously. Just remember that.